Die sieben Wünsche bei Johann Gottfried Herder. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hätte ich sieben Wünsch in meiner Gewalt, was wünscht ich? Nicht Glück und Ehren mannigfalt, den schönsten, liebsten Aufenthalt, den wünscht ich. Der Wunsch ist in des Manns Gewalt, nicht Glück und Ehren mannigfalt, lieb ist der schönste Aufenthalt. Der zweite Wunsch in meiner Gewalt, was wünscht ich? Nie sei des Freundes Herz mir kalt, nie sei mir lieb und Leben alt, das wünsch ich. Der Wunsch ist in des Manns Gewalt, nie sei dein Herz dem Freunde kalt, nie sei uns lieb und Leben alt. Der dritte Wunsch, und er ist mein, was wünsch ich? An anderer Glück mich zu erfreuen, mit meinem Glück vergnügt zu sein, das wünsch ich. Der Wunsch ist unser insgemein, mit unserem Glück zufrieden sein, macht uns an anderer Glück uns freuen. Der vierte ist in meiner Gewalt, was wünsch ich? Ein frisches Herz, so lang es wald, bei Jugendkraft und Wohlgestalt, das wünsch ich. Der Wunsch ist in des Manns Gewalt, ein frisches Herz, so lang es wald, schafft Jugendkraft und Wohlgestalt. Der Wunsch ist jetzt in meiner Hand, was wünsch ich? Verachtend Vorurteil und Tand, zu leben für mein Vaterland, das wünsch ich. Der Wunsch ist in des Mannes Hand, verachtend Vorurteil und Tand, ist Menschheit unser Vaterland. Der sechste Wunsch in meiner Gewalt, was wünsch ich? Den süßen Ruhm, der nie verhallt, der aus dem Herzen widerschallt, den wünsch ich. Der Wunsch ist in des Manns Gewalt, der süße Ruhm, der nie verhallt, ist der aus Herzen widerschallt. Der letzte Wunsch in meiner Gewalt, was wünsch ich? Ist der, den kaum die Lippe lallt, ein stiller Wunsch, komm er mir bald. Des Herzens mächtigster Gewalt ist das, was kaum die Lippe lallt, ein stiller Wunsch, komm er uns bald. End of die sieben Wünsche bei Johann Gottfried Herder Wett bei Julia Niedermeyer Die sieben Schwestern bei Karl Simrock This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Die sieben Schwestern, habt acht, habt acht, wir könnten scheitern, da würden's acht. Sie trieben immer mit Liebe Spott. Die Felsenherzen, das rächte Gott. Dort über Wesel, wo Schönberg ragt, da haben sie manchen Verliebten geplagt. Erst angezogen, verlacht hernach und heimgesendet mit Hohn und Schmach. Hier sind sie versunken dafür im Rhein, in Fels verwandelt und harten Stein. Und wenn ein Schieflein vorüberfährt, das sei mit Spröden nun nicht beschwert. Die niemals liebte, sie muß herbei, dass bei den sieben die achte sei. Ist eine Spröde hier auf dem Schiff, so wird's zerschallen am Felsenriff. Wir Dreie hätten nicht Schuld daran, denn wir sind Frauen und lieben den Mann. Das wollen wir hoffen, und wär es nicht wahr, wir alle schwebten in großer Gefahr. So bin ich eine verlobte Braut, die nie verlangend nach andern schaut. Das wollen wir hoffen, und wär es nicht wahr, wir alle schwebten in großer Gefahr. Ich bin noch ledig, doch will ich gestehen, dass ich den und jenen nicht ungern gesehen. Das wollen wir hoffen, und wär es nicht wahr, wir alle schwebten in großer Gefahr. Mit alten Jungfer spricht niemand Trost, doch dieses Hündchen mir freundlich kost. Das wollen wir hoffen, und wär es nicht wahr, wir alle schwebten in großer Gefahr. Zwölfjährige, dass ihr nicht jämmerlicher trinken müsst, hab ich heimlich des Nachbars Gottfriedchen geküsst. Das wollen wir hoffen, und wär es nicht wahr, wir alle schwebten in großer Gefahr. End of die sieben Schwestern bei Karl Simrock Read bei Julia Niedermeyer In the Seven Woods by W. B. Yeats This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I have heard the pigeons of the seven woods make their faint thunder, and the garden bees hum in the lime tree flowers, and put away the unavailing outcries and the old bitterness that empty the heart. I have forgot a while Terra uprooted, and new commonness upon the throne, and crying about the streets, and hanging its paper flowers from post to post because it is alone of all things happy. I am contented, 
for I know that quiet wanders laughing and eating her wild heart among pigeons and bees, while that great archer, who but awaits his hour to shoot, still hangs a cloudy quiver over Park Na Lee. End of In the Seven Woods by W. B. Yeats The Seven Sermons to the Dead by Carl Gustav Jung This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Septem Sermones Ad Mortuos, 1916 the Seven Sermons to the Dead, written by Basilides in Alexandria, the city where the East toucheth the West. Sermo 1 The dead came back from Jerusalem where they found not what they sought. They prayed me let them in and besought my word, and thus I began my teaching. Hearken, I begin with nothingness. Nothingness is the same as fullness. In infinity full is no better than empty. Nothingness is both empty and full. As well might ye say anything else of nothingness as, for instance, white is it, or black, or again, it is not, or it is. A thing that is infinite and eternal hath no qualities, since it hath all qualities. This nothingness or fullness we name the pleroma. Therein both thinking and being cease since the eternal and infinite possess no qualities in it no being is for he then would be distinct from the pleroma and would possess qualities which would distinguish him as something distinct from the pleroma in the pleroma there is nothing and everything it is quite fruitless to think about the pleroma for this would mean self-dissolution. Creatura is not in the pleroma, but in itself. The pleroma is both beginning and end of created beings. It pervadeth them, as the light of the sun everywhere pervadeth the air. Although the pleroma pervadeth altogether, yet hath created being no share thereof, just as a holy transparent body becometh neither light nor dark through the light which pervadeth it we are however the pleroma itself for we are a part of the eternal and infinite but we have no share thereof as we are from the pleroma infinitely removed not spiritually or temporally but essentially since we are distinguished from the pleroma in our essence as creatura which is confined within time and space yet because we are parts of the pleroma the pleroma is also in us even in the smallest point is the pleroma endless eternal and entire since small and great are qualities which are contained in it it is that nothingness which is everywhere whole and continuous. Only figuratively, therefore, do I speak of created being as a part of the pleroma, because actually the pleroma is nowhere divided, since it is nothingness. We are also the whole pleroma, because, figuratively, the pleroma is the smallest point, assumed only not existing, in us and the boundless firmament about us. But wherefore then do we speak of the pleroma at all, since it is thus everything and nothing? I speak of it to make a beginning somewhere, 
and also to free you from the delusion that somewhere either without or within there standeth something fixed or in some way established from the beginning every so-called fixed and certain thing is only relative that alone is fixed and certain which is subject to change what is changeable however is creatura therefore is it the one thing which is fixed and certain because it hath qualities it is even quality itself the question ariseth how did creatura originate created beings came to pass not creatura since created being is the very quality of the pleroma as much as non-creation which is the eternal death in all times and places is creation in all times and places is death the pleroma hath all distinctiveness and non-distinctiveness distinctiveness is creatura it is distinct distinctiveness is its essence and therefore it distinguisheth therefore man discriminateth because his nature is distinctiveness wherefore also he distinguisheth qualities of the pleroma which are not he distinguisheth them out of his own nature therefore must he speak of qualities of the pleroma which are not what use say ye to speak of it saidst thou not thyself there is no profit in thinking upon the pleroma that said i unto you to free you from the delusion that we are able to think about the pleroma when we distinguish qualities of the pleroma we are speaking from the ground of our own distinctiveness and concerning our own distinctiveness but we have said nothing concerning the pleroma concerning our own distinctiveness however it is needful to speak whereby we may distinguish ourselves enough our very nature is distinctiveness if we are not true to this nature we do not distinguish ourselves enough therefore must we make distinctions of qualities what is the harm ye ask in not distinguishing oneself if we do not distinguish we get beyond our own nature away from creatura we fall into indistinctiveness which is the other quality of the pleroma we fall into the pleroma itself and cease to be creatures we are given over to dissolution in the nothingness this is the death of the creature therefore we die in such measure as we do not distinguish hence the natural striving of the creature goeth towards distinctiveness fighteth against primeval perilous sameness this is called the principium individuationis this principle is the essence of the creature from this you can see why indistinctiveness and non-distinction are a great danger for the creature we must therefore distinguish the qualities of the pleroma the qualities are pairs of opposites such as the effective and the ineffective fullness and emptiness living and dead difference and sameness light and darkness the hot and the cold force and matter time and space good and evil beauty and ugliness the one and the many etc the pairs of opposites are qualities of the pleroma which are not because each balanceth each as we are the pleroma itself we also have all these qualities in us because the very ground of our nature is distinctiveness therefore we have these qualities in the name and sign of distinctiveness which meaneth one 
these qualities are distinct and separate in us one from the other therefore they are not balanced and void but are effective thus are we the victims of the pairs of opposites the pleroma is rent in us two the qualities belong to the pleroma and only in the name and sign of distinctiveness can and must we possess or live them we must distinguish ourselves from qualities in the pleroma they are balanced and void in us not being distinguished from them delivereth us when we strive after the good or the beautiful we thereby forget our own nature which is distinctiveness and we are delivered over to the qualities of the pleroma which are pairs of opposites we labour to attain to the good and the beautiful yet at the same time we also lay hold of the evil and the ugly since in the pleroma these are one with the good and the beautiful when however we remain true to our own nature which is distinctiveness we distinguish ourselves from the good and the beautiful and therefore at the same time from the evil and the ugly and thus we fall not into the pleroma namely into nothingness and dissolution thou sayest ye object that difference and sameness are also qualities of the pleroma how would it be then if we strive after difference are we in so doing not true to our own nature and must we none the less be given over to sameness when we strive after difference ye must not forget that the pleroma hath no qualities we create them through thinking if therefore ye strive after difference or sameness or any qualities whatsoever ye pursue thoughts which flow to you out of the pleroma thoughts namely concerning non-existing qualities of the pleroma inasmuch as ye run after these thoughts ye fall again into the pleroma and reach difference and sameness at the same time not your thinking but your being is distinctiveness therefore not after difference as ye think it must ye strive but after your own being at bottom therefore there is only one striving namely the striving after your own being if ye had this striving ye would not need to know anything about the pleroma and its qualities and yet would ye come to your right goal by virtue of your own being since however thought estrangeth from being that knowledge must i teach you wherewith ye might be able to hold your thought in leash sermo two in the night the dead stood along the wall and cried we would have knowledge of god where is god is god dead god is not dead now as ever he liveth god is creatura for he is something definite and therefore distinct from the pleroma god is quality of the pleroma and everything which i said of creatura also is true concerning him he is distinguished however from created beings through this that he is more indefinite and indeterminable than they he is less distinct than created beings since the ground of his being is effective fullness only in so far as he is definite and distinct is he creatura and in like measure is he the manifestation of the effective fullness of the pleroma everything which we do not distinguish falleth into the pleroma and is made void by its opposite if therefore we do not distinguish god effective fullness is for us extinguished 
moreover god is the pleroma itself as likewise each smallest point in the created and uncreated is the pleroma itself effective void is the nature of the devil god and devil are the first manifestations of nothingness which we call the pleroma it is indifferent whether the pleroma is or is not since in everything it is balanced and void not so creatura in so far as god and devil are creatura they do not extinguish each other but stand one against the other as effective opposites we need no proof of their existence it is enough that we must always be speaking of them even if both were not creatura of its own essential distinctiveness would forever distinguish them anew out of the pleroma everything that discrimination taketh out of the pleroma is a pair of opposites to god therefore always belongeth the devil this inseparability is as close and as your own life hath made you see as indissoluble as the pleroma itself thus it is that both stand very close to the pleroma in which all opposites are extinguished and joined god and devil are distinguished by the qualities fullness and emptiness generation and destruction effectiveness is common to both effectiveness joineth them effectiveness therefore standeth above both is a god above god since in its effect it uniteth fullness and emptiness this is a god whom ye knew not for mankind forgot it we name it by its name abraxas it is more indefinite still than god and devil that god may be distinguished from it we name god helios or sun abraxas is effect nothing standeth opposed to it but the ineffective hence its effective nature freely unfoldeth itself the ineffective is not therefore resisteth not abraxas standeth above the sun and above the devil it is improbable probability unreal reality had the pleroma a being abraxas would be its manifestation it is the effective itself not any particular effect but effect in general it is unreal reality because it hath no definite effect it is also creatura because it is distinct from the pleroma the sun hath a definite effect and so hath the devil wherefore do they appear to us more effective than indefinite abraxas it is force duration change the dead now raised a great tumult for they were christians sermo three like mists arising from a marsh the dead came near and cried speak further unto us concerning the supreme god hard to know is the deity of abraxas its power is the greatest because man perceiveth it not from the sun he draweth the summum bonum from the devil the infium malum but from abraxas life altogether indefinite the mother of good and evil smaller and weaker life seemeth to be than the summum bonum wherefore is it also hard to conceive that abraxas transcendeth even the sun in power who is himself the radiant source of all the force of life abraxas is the sun and at the same time the eternally sucking gorge of the void 
the belittling and dismembering devil the power of abraxas is twofold but ye see it not because for your eyes the warring opposites of this power are extinguished what the god son speaketh is life what the devil speaketh is death but abraxas speaketh that hallowed and accursed word which is life and death at the same time abraxas begetteth truth and lying good and evil light and darkness in the same word and in the same act wherefore is abraxas terrible it is splendid as the lion in the instant he striketh down his victim it is beautiful as a day of spring it is the great pan himself and also the small one it is priapos it is the monster of the underworld a thousand armed polyp coiled not of winged serpents frenzy it is the hermaphrodite of the earliest beginning it is the lord of the toads and frogs which live in the water and go up on the land whose chorus ascendeth at noon and at midnight it is abundance that seeketh union with emptiness it is holy begetting it is love and love's murder it is the saint and his betrayer it is the brightest light of day and the darkest night of madness to look upon it is blindness to know it is sickness to worship it is death to fear it is wisdom to resist it not is redemption god dwelleth behind the sun the devil behind the night what god bringeth forth out of the light the devil sucketh into the night but abraxas is the world its becoming and its passing upon every gift that cometh from the god son the devil layeth his curse everything that ye entreat from the god's son begetteth a deed of the devil everything that ye create with the god's son giveth effective power to the devil that is terrible abraxas it is the mightiest creature and in it the creature is afraid of itself it is the manifest opposition of creatura to the pleroma and its nothingness it is the son's horror of the mother it is the mother's love for the son it is the delight of the earth and the cruelty of the heavens before its countenance man becometh like stone before it there is no question and no reply it is the life of creatura it is the operation of distinctiveness it is the love of man it is the speech of man it is the appearance and the shadow of man it is illusory reality now the dead howled and raged for they were unperfected sermo four the dead filled the place murmuring and said tell us of gods and devils accursed one the god's son is the highest good the devil is the opposite thus have ye two gods but there are many high and good things and many great evils among these are two god devils the one is the burning one the other the growing one the burning one is eros who hath the form of flame flame giveth light because it consumeth the growing one is the tree of life it buddeth as in growing it heapeth up living stuff eros flameth up and dieth but the tree of life groweth with slow and constant increase through unmeasured time good and evil are united in the flame good and evil 
are united in the increase of the tree in their divinity stand life and love opposed innumerable as the host of the stars is the number of gods and devils each star is a god and each space that a star filleth is a devil but the empty fullness of the whole is the pleroma the operation of the whole is abraxas to whom only the ineffective standeth opposed four is the number of the principal gods as four is the number of the world's measurements one is the beginning the god's son two is eros for he bindeth twain together and outspreadeth himself in brightness three is the tree of life for it filleth space with bodily forms four is the devil for he openeth all that is closed all that is formed of bodily nature doth he dissolve he is the destroyer in whom everything is brought to nothing for me to whom knowledge hath been given of the multiplicity and diversity of the gods it is well but woe unto you who replace these incompatible many by a single god for in so doing ye beget the torment which is bred from not understanding and ye mutilate the creature whose nature and aim is distinctiveness how can ye be true to your own nature when ye try to change the many into one what ye do unto the gods is done likewise unto you ye all become equal and thus is your nature maimed equality shall prevail not for god but only for the sake of man for the gods are many whilst men are few the gods are mighty and can endure their manifoldness for like the stars they abide in solitude parted one from the other by immense distances but men are weak and cannot endure their manifold nature therefore they dwell together and need communion that they may bear their separateness for redemption's sake i teach you the rejected truth for the sake of which i was rejected the multiplicity of the gods correspondeth to the multiplicity of man numberless gods await the human state numberless gods have been men man shareth in the nature of the gods he cometh from the gods and goeth unto god thus just as it serveth not to reflect upon the pleroma it availeth not to worship the multiplicity of the gods least of all availeth it to worship the first god the effective abundance and the summum bonum by our prayer we can add to it nothing and from it nothing take because the effective void swalloweth all the bright gods form the celestial world it is manifold and infinitely spreading and increasing the god's son is the supreme lord of that world the dark gods form the earth world they are simple and infinitely diminishing and declining the devil is the earth world's lowest lord the moon spirit satellite of the earth smaller colder and more dead than the earth there is no difference between the might of the celestial gods and those of the earth the celestial gods magnify the earth gods diminish measureless is the movement of both sermo five the dead mocked and cried teach us fool of the church and holy communion the world of the gods is made manifest in spirituality and in sexuality the celestial ones appear in spirituality 
the earthly in sexuality spirituality conceiveth and embraceth it is womanlike and therefore we call it mater celestis the celestial mother sexuality engendereth and createth it is manlike and therefore we call it phallos the earthly father the sexuality of man is more of the earth the sexuality of woman is more of the spirit the spirituality of man is more of heaven it goeth to the greater the spirituality of woman is more of the earth it goeth to the smaller lying and devilish is the spirituality of the man which goeth to the smaller lying and devilish is the spirituality of the woman which goeth to the greater each must go to its own place man and woman become devils one to the other when they divide not their spiritual ways for the nature of creatura is distinctiveness the sexuality of man hath an earthward course the sexuality of woman a spiritual man and woman become devils one to the other if they distinguish not their sexuality man shall know of the smaller woman the greater man shall distinguish himself both from spirituality and from sexuality he shall call spirituality mother and set her between heaven and earth he shall call sexuality phallus and set him between himself and earth for the mother and the phallus are superhuman demons which reveal the world of the gods they are for us more effective than the gods because they are closely akin to our own nature should ye not distinguish yourselves from sexuality and from spirituality and not regard them as of a nature both above you and beyond then are ye delivered over to them as qualities of the pleroma spirituality and sexuality are not your qualities not things which ye possess and contain but they possess and contain you for they are powerful demons manifestations of the gods and are therefore things which reach beyond you existing in themselves no man hath a spirituality unto himself or a sexuality unto himself but he standeth under the law of spirituality and of sexuality no man therefore escapeth these demons ye shall look upon them as demons and as a common task and danger a common burden which life hath laid upon you thus is life for you also a common task and danger as are the gods and first of all terrible abraxas man is weak therefore is communion indispensable if your communion be not under the sign of the mother then is it under the sign of the phallos no communion is suffering and sickness communion in everything is dismemberment and dissolution distinctiveness leadeth to singleness singleness is opposed to communion but because of man's weakness over against the gods and demons and their invincible law is communion needful therefore shall there be as much communion as is needful not for man's sake but because of the gods the gods force you to communion as much as they force you so much is communion needed more is evil in communion let every man submit to others that communion be maintained for ye need it in singleness the one man shall be superior to the others that every man may come to himself and avoid slavery in communion there shall be continence in singleness 
there shall be prodigality communion is depth singleness is height right measure in communion purifieth and preserveth right measure in singleness purifieth and increaseth communion giveth us warmth singleness giveth us light sermo six the demon of sexuality approacheth our soul as a serpent it is half human and appeareth as thought desire the demon of spirituality descendeth into our soul as the white bird it is half human and appeareth as desire thought the serpent is an earthy soul half demonic a spirit and akin to the spirits of the dead thus too like these she swarmeth around in the things of the earth making us either to fear them or pricking us with intemperate desires the serpent hath a nature like unto woman she seeketh ever the company of the dead who are held by the spell of the earth they who found not the way beyond that leadeth to singleness the serpent is a whore she wantoneth with the devil and with evil spirits a mischievous tyrant and tormentor ever seducing to evilest company the white bird is a half celestial soul of man he bideth with the mother from time to time descending the bird hath a nature like unto man and is effective thought he is chaste and solitary a messenger of the mother he flieth high above the earth he commandeth singleness he bringeth knowledge from the distant ones who went before and are perfected he beareth our word above to the mother she intercedeth she warneth but against the gods she hath no power she is a vessel of the sun the serpent goeth below and with her cunning she lameth the phallic demon or else goadeth him on she yieldeth up the two crafty thoughts of the earthy one those thoughts which creep through every hole and cleave to all things with desirousness the serpent doubtless willeth it not yet she must be of use to us she fleeth our grasp thus showing us the way which with our human wits we could not find with disdainful glance the dead spake cease this talk of gods and demons and souls at bottom this hath long been known to us sermo seven yet when night was come the dead again approached with lamentable mien and said there is yet one matter we forgot to mention teach us about man man is a gateway through which from the outer world of gods demons and souls ye pass into the inner world out of the greater into the smaller world small and transitory is man already is he behind you and once again ye find yourselves in endless space in the smaller or innermost infinity at immeasurable distance standeth one single star in the zenith this is the one god of this one man this is his world his pleroma his divinity in this world is man abraxas the creator and the destroyer of his own world this star is the god and the goal of man this is his one guiding god in him goeth man to his rest toward him goeth the long journey of the soul after death in him shineth forth as light all that man bringeth back from the greater world to this one god man shall pray prayer increaseth the light of the star it casteth a bridge over death 
it prepareth life for the smaller world and assuageth the hopeless desires of the greater when the greater world waxeth cold burneth the star between man and his one god there standeth nothing so long as man can turn away his eyes from the flaming spectacle of abraxas man here god there weakness and nothingness here there eternally creative power here nothing but darkness and chilling moisture there holy sun whereupon the dead were silent and ascended like the smoke above the herdsman's fire who through the night kept watch over his flock anagramma natri hekunda gahina feratonin segge surklak Sonus. End of the Seven Sermons to the Dead by Carl Gustav Jung. Read by Cynthia Moyer. Die Sieben Hügel by Friederike Brunn. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Auf grüner, grüner Heide stehen sieben Hügelein. Es flüstern Wind im schaurigen Tal, es tanzen Elfen auf mondlichem Strahl. Singt, Mädlein, auf grüner Heide, singt. Leide, leide, leide. Im tiefen Wiesengrunde glänzt fern ein Weiher hell. Es klagen Unken aus tiefem Moor, es steigen Gebilde, so dunstig empor. Singt, Mädlein, auf grüner Heide, singt. Leide, leide, leide. Hier war vor grauen Jahren ein König, reich und groß. Er war gezogen in Krieg und Schlacht, hat nicht der sieben Töchterlein dacht. Singt, Mädlein, auf grüner Heide, singt. Leide, leide, leide. Die sieben Jungfrauen walten im hohen Buchenhain. Es rauschte das Meer mit nichtigem Schaum, es sauste der Sturm im luftigen Baum. Singt, Mädlein auf grüner Heide, singt, leide, leide, leide. Es schwellen weiße Segel vom Kullerfelsen her. Ach, Stano kömmt, der wilde Held, o König, wie hast du dein Haus bestellt? Singt, Mädlein auf grüner Heide, singt, leide, leide, leide. Ans weiße Sandgestade steckt schnell das Kriegesheer. Die Jungfrauen fliehen bergab und an, verfolgt von Reuter, von Ross und Mann. Singt, Mädlein auf grüner Heide, singt. Leide, leide, leide. Wir sahen euch schnell und sicher, ihr weißen Vögelein. Zu Spott und Hohn, wir fangen euch aus. Der Vater kann finden das leere Haus. Singt, Mädlein auf grüner Heide, singt. Leide, leide, leide. Wie Blätter vor dem Sturme entflohen die Mägdelein, doch dicht am wehenden Schleierlein verfolgten die Reiter sie hinterdrein. Singt, Mädlein auf grüner Heide, singt, leide, leide, leide. Da glänzt im Abendstrahle der Kühle war ja hell. Drein hüpften die Mägdlein leicht und schön und wurden nimmermehr gesehen. Singt, Mädlein auf grüner Heide, singt, leide, leide, leide. Auf grüner, grüner Heide stehen sieben Hügelein. Dort ruhen die Jungfrauen im kühlen Moos, dort klagen die Vöglein im Maigespross. Singt, Mädlein, auf grüner Heide, singt, leide, leide, leide. End of Die sieben Hügel bei Friederike Brunn Read bei Julia Niedermeyer Die sieben Steine bei Preußlitz bei Unbekannt This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Der Sonntag kam mit seiner Feierstunde und fromm zur Kirche rief des Küsters lauten und Beter nahten weither aus der Runde. Das Kirchlein, drin sie oft sich schon erbauten, 
schloß freundlich sie in seine heilgen Arme, dass manchen da die Augen übertauten. Das kranke Herz ward frei vom irdischen Harme, ein heilger Fried erhob's auf enge Schwingen, nicht fleht's umsonst, o Herr, dich meiner Barme. Horch, durch der Orgel sanfte Töne dringen, wo plötzlich klänge einer alten Fiedel und Lärm, als wenn im Tanz die Bursche springen. Kam da ins Land ein Mönch, ein greiser Siedel, wer las nicht Frömmigkeit in seinen Zügen, und doch ist er's, der draußen spielt die Fiedel. O, oh, nicht durch äußern Schein lasst euch betrügen, er war verstoßen aus des Klosters Mauern, ob seiner Zunge Gott verfluchtem Lügen. Doch ließ sich das der böse Wicht nicht dauern, nein, Rache seine tief im schwarzen Herzen, wie ein Eber treut dem Weidmann mit den Hauern. Begann, ob heilgem Gottesdienst zu scherzen, so ließ der Schwach vom Satan sich betören und Gottes heilge Diener anzuschwärzen. Auch heute möchte er fromme Andacht stören, doch wie? Er leiht sich eine alte Geige und schnell lässt er als Virtuos sich hören. Der Zug der Beter geht schon auf die Neige, nur noch drei Pärchen, Bursch und blonde Mägde, sie schlendern kichernd nach dem Himmel reiche. Halt, denkt der Mönch, in dem die Hölle sich regte, jetzt gilt's, recht lustige Stückchen will ich geigen, und flux den Fiedelbogen er bewegte. Die Pärchen stehen und horchen und bezeigen gar große Lust, ehe sie zur Kirche gehen, sich hier zu drehen im leicht geschwungenen Reigen. Spricht da ein Bursch, hört doch, Gott in der Höhen wird erst gesungen, vor des Pfarrers Rede ist unser Tänzchen abgemacht, geschehen. Da taten denn die Mädchen auch nicht spröde, und hin im Wald so fliegen sie behende, und keines glaubt, dass Unrecht drum es täte. Und in der Kirche ist der Gesang am Ende, sie tanzen noch, ei, nur noch fünf Minuten, der Mönch geigt fort, als ob in Glut er stände. Doch plötzlich jetzt die wilden Tänzer ruhten, verstummt der Rede Gott verfluchtes Lästern, und von den Wangen fliehen schnell die Gluten. Die Bursche rufen, tanzt doch, liebe Schwestern, und können selbst die Füße nicht mehr heben. Ach, rief die ein, ich schlief nicht aus von gestern. Und hin, durch alle Zittern eisges Beben, ein Schatten ist an ihnen hingegangen, und sie sind Stein und keines mehr am Leben. Da rauscht die Orgel auf, die Frommen sangen, requiescant in Pace. End of die sieben Steine bei Preußlitz, bei Unbekannt. Red bei Julia Niedermeyer. Seven Factors of Education by Henry Fairfield Osborne. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Factors of Education. Produce, produce! exclaims Teufeldrock in Sartor Resartus. Were it but the pitifulest infinitesimal fraction of a product, produce it! In God's name, tis the utmost thou hast in thee. Out with it, then. Part 1. The Conditions Many years ago I was profoundly impressed in reading, for the first time, Ruskin's Seven Lamps of Architecture, a setting forth the universal illuminance of architecture, the architecture of all time and of every people. Am I too venturesome to enter an arena so warmly contested, as that of modern teaching and endeavour to determine whether there are also universal illuminants which lighten the way to the perfect training of the mind? Is there in education as in architecture an absolute code derived from the intellectual experience of generations of thinkers, a code for every subject for all time and for every people? Or is a general revolt from authority, which is the most conspicuous tendency of our times, to leave education also without the sanction of experience? I was drawn to these questions, first by consciousness of somewhat cloudy thought in the matter, consoled only by signs of similar cloudiness in others, second, by rising indignation against the apparent infection of education in this country with certain material and experimental tendencies as if from the contamination of a triumphantly successful commercial age. My inquiry has not resulted in the discovery of new laws. Separately, the illuminance of education are as near and familiar parts of our intellectual inheritance as collectively they are far from lighting the long and often obscure paths of the average teacher. Few perceive with a clear vision of posthumous critics and biographers that the over-cultivation of one or more of the factors distinguishes the ill-balanced from the well-balanced mind, 
the inefficient from the efficient student from the broad standpoint of symmetry many very learned men as well as many great observers are alike imperfectly educated and for this their guides and masters in part at least may be held responsible one work i have studied by a man of high authority omits all reference to what i regard as the supreme factor of education my inquisitive route is one of observation rather than of theory it follows the lives of men rather than the ways of the books consider huxley although not the most creative thinker as the best pattern of the educated englishman of the last century and carefully observing the gradual attainment of his perfect discipline we find it arose less through his teachers than through his own discernment of the collective and cumulative value of several educational factors and his deliberate purpose to experience them all so far as lay in his power pasteur guided by a similar instinct actually resisted the advice of some of his professors similarly we observe the superb education of darwin and of spencer as chiefly a self-schooling growing out of the consciousness of certain intellectual wants such mental appetite and the determination to satisfy it being one of the symptoms of greatness from such biographies from the actual methods of the great teachers it appears that there are universal illuminants that there is an absolute code by which to develop the infinitesimal as well as the almost infinite powers of the human mind the material and experimental spirit in america in contemporary american life there are two currents which are setting away from rather than toward a cleaner perception of the universal in education these are our materialism and our experimentalism much of the material spirit undeniably pervades our college halls and mars the otherwise splendid progress of educational idealism in this country computers are heralding great gifts and statistical increases in which numbers are swelled by some schools by dental veterinary and miscellaneous departments as if to maintain prestige on a distinctive quantitative rather than on qualitative basis experimentalism is partly an intruder from our material atmosphere partly an offspring of the general revolt from authority it is a truism of trade that our manufacturers owe a large measure of their supremacy to their readiness to abandon old machinery and substitute new it is as much an american instinct to welcome change as it is an english instinct to shrink from it was not the manufacturer's spirit more or less pervasive in the boston meeting of the national educational association of nineteen o three when the prolonged debate was summarized with some irony and much truth in the statement that from electives and courses we are to pass to experiments with curriculums as a whole and with a period of studies on a grand scale in other words that the colleges shall compete in the cultivation of brains after different fashions just as rival furnaces are competing and experimenting in the production of steel that we are to witness the survival of the fittest institution we shall turn out the largest quantity of the best product in the shortest possible time and thus most thoroughly exemplify the spirit of american trade confused by the tremendous inrush of new knowledge we have already been experimenting for some years past perhaps our impulse for facile modification and adaptation is nowhere more conspicuous than in the rapid movements of these decades prompted by the fallacy of regarding change as identical with progress and ignoring the fundamental evolutionary law that change is as often retrogressive as progressive it is quite possible not to say probable that many of the sweeping alterations which have taken place and are now contemplated are distinct retrogressions and we remove us further and further from solid intellectual advance that they conform to the commercial spirit rather than transform it that some of our ablest educators have been unwittingly contributing to a backward movement by failing to grasp clearly in their own minds or to set clearly before the nation the slow and difficult steps which are necessary to teach men how to think and how to produce consider the case of the college it is generally but not altogether fairly alleged that it is a patient that it is a sick organism even that it has reached a condition which may be regarded as useless remedies are being administered not from any very clear system of educational therapeutics but on the rule that when one tonic fails another shall be given trial a capping process or drawing blood is suggested one presidential doctor prescribes four years of life another allows three years another two another proposes to cut short life altogether 
predicting the extinction of the college and the direct passage from the high school to the university. Extinction is a reductio ad absurdum. Such an end to experimentalism would be a national calamity, because schools can never equal colleges, either in resources or in fitting for citizenship, because the longer period of the education of the larger number would fall into the hands of women teachers, who are constantly multiplying in the public schools, because the democratic social spirit, so vital to the college, is fatal to the university, the future triumph of which depends chiefly upon the enforcement of the idea that here belongs exclusively the young intellectual aristocracy of the country. Even abbreviation may be another instance of failure to distinguish between progressive and retrogressive evolution. If a year be cut from college, to adjust the year which has been added to the school, by belated entrance or advancing standards of admission, the net result is to substitute a year or two of school life for a year of college life. Is this a progressive change? Is not a college year rich in historical associations, teaching capacity, libraries, laboratories, museums, and all the other products of generous endowment of more value than a school year? Similarly, if learning or the acquisition of general knowledge remains in fashion, even by apology as a specific function of the college, does not the prodigious intellectual advance of the nineteenth century tend to lengthen rather than shorten the college course of the twentieth century? If the college period is to be changed, would not a consistent movement be the opposite of an abbreviation? Would it not be for the more effective school the earlier admission to college? I do not pretend to settle this very difficult question, but only to put it in the light of an evolution problem. The friends of the patient advance a traditional plea that the college is to be preserved as the home of liberal culture, a laudable reason for prolonged life, which, however, contains an element of indefiniteness. Here we approach a more rational diagnosis of the disorder, which in itself suggests a remedy. Liberal culture, for what end or purpose, one may ask. Is not this lack of purpose, this dysteleology, to borrow an echolism, the internal disorder which has bred the pathological condition of the college during the very years when the university and the technical school have flourished like green bay trees. Refreshing definiteness of purpose in training for material production is the invigorating principle of the technical schools which show no signs of internal disorder or degeneration, and as to the utility of which there is no question. No one proposes to cut their periods from four years to three, or to two, or to eliminate these schools altogether. They have their weaknesses, but no one charges them with dysteleology. Similarly, production in the form of original research is a definite ideal of the American universities. This ideal was first embodied among us in the early years of the Johns Hopkins University, when, with an assemblage of gifted teachers and with a flower of American students, the average results throughout all the departments were commensurate with the best attained anywhere, and at once spread throughout the world the new and momentous fact that America could establish and maintain a university. Such an ideal is, however, not maintained, chiefly because the American university at present rests upon the insecure foundation sands of superficial college work. It was my privilege recently, in one of the most imposing of academic processions, to walk beside a profound student of international law, I could not help feeling the lack of proportion between the form and the substance, the flowery display of hoods and gowns, and the productive scholarship actually represented. How can we live up to these brilliant colours? I observed to my companion. How can we be as learned as we appear? Raising his hand above his head, he jokingly replied, By putting the dollars up there, by making the teaching profession more of an object. This partly jesting and partly truthful answer did not include all the reasons why American intellectual production has not reached the general grade of that of the old world, and if I have spoken of the college, of the school, of the university as separate, I have misled. There can be no discontinuity. A serious answer to this jesting question would be that we shall be as learned as we appear in America when, not only in university, but in school and college, we reach a perfectly clear understanding of and unite our energies in the chief object of education, namely, the inculcation of those factors which, according to the several abilities and predispositions of men, culminate in the several forms of productive activity. Production is conceived with Carlyle as the man's output, as the utmost he has in him, his resourcefulness, his centrifugal, 
rather than centripetal life, in its highest form his creative power. If training for production vitalizes the technical schools, if it is the ideal of our universities, is it not evident that such training, in the broader sense, is the restorative principle of the American college, that the collegiate antidote is not to be found in further experimentation, in lengthening or shortening periods, in eliminating Greek or mathematics or any other difficult subjects, in a rigid required system, or in a universal elective system, nor even in inducing men to think and study by means of a perceptual system, admirable as it may prove to be, but that the elusive remedy is rather to be sought in the application of a basal or universally working theory of education. In such a theory, we are first to substitute the newer centrifugal ideal of production for the older centripetal ideal of liberal culture. Liberal culture, that indefinable quality imparted by learning, multiplied by the sense of beauty, is to be the stepping stone, is to be the obligato, or running accompaniment, rather than the solo. It is to be the stage, rather than the summation. Second, we are to ascertain in what sense, in what measure, and by what means, the college may range itself with the polytechnicum and the university, as a school for training producers. Such training is a very serious undertaking. If there is any field of human activity in which it is light or easy, I do not know of it, but rather content from the precept and example of my chief masters, McCosh, Huxley, and Balfour, and from the much more exacting master, experience, that the road from nothing to culture, and from culture to the point where man produces anything of the least value, is an extremely long and hard one. I contend that some of our leading educators in the Boston Convention of 1903 were hastening the tide of American haste and superficiality, instead of sternly telling that great assemblage of teachers of the nation some unpalatable truths as to our still subordinate position among the thinking producers of the world. If we are to direct education throughout into the regional, the creative, rather than into the receptive, the absorbent, the critical temper of medievalism, I do not know how we can more clearly introduce its relation to our school and college life and to the further elevation of our university life than by a series of contrasts which will lead the way back to the main question as to what are the factors of education which culminate in production. Modern Medievalism and True Modernism The medieval university, observed one of the greatest teachers of the last century, looked backwards. It professed to be a storehouse of old knowledge, and, except in the way of dialectic cobweb spinning, its professors had nothing to do with novelties. Of the historical and physical natural sciences, of criticism and laboratory practice, it knew nothing. Oral teaching was of supreme importance on account of the cost and rarity of manuscripts. The modern university looks forward and is a factory of new knowledge. Its professors have to be at the top of the wave of progress. Research and criticism must be in the breath of their nostrils. Laboratory work, the main business of the scientific student, books his main helpers. The cardinal fact in the university question appears to me to be this, that the student to whose wants the medieval university was adjusted looked to the past and sought book learning, while the modern looks to the future and seeks the knowledge of things. Huxley. What is medievalism? Is it not surviving the methods proposed and continued in some of the most modern professional systems? I am inclined to answer the second question in the affirmative. We should not for a moment fall into the almost universal error of confusing medievalism in education with classicism, an error which has been widely disseminated by such brilliant and effective essays as Adams' A College Fetish. Greece and Rome illustrate the distinction. The relatively non-productive Romans were partially medieval. Rome, economically and in a large measure intellectually and artistically a parasitic or centripetal state, was supported by phenomenal military genius and genuine centrifugal or constructive powers in law and government. Not so with highly centrifugal Greece. Greek supremacy was no accident. It was due to great educational conceptions applied to a people purified by race, culture, and selection. In education, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle were eminently men of their period, or moderns, as we learn from their frequently reiterated views. 
it will be recalled that the socratic solution of the educational problem was that the new state of society was to be based on knowledge that the germs of knowledge were inherent in every human being by virtue of his own experience and that these germs could be developed by the dialectic process the whole bent of socrates as a teacher was the cultivation of originality his rule that to educate a youth the less we think for him and the more he thinks for himself the better is the root of the true modern spirit because it is the first step toward production louis agassiz professedly adopted the socratic method in teaching zoology and huxley's method was largely socratic plato observed we next come to arithmetic geometry and astronomy all citizens shall learn the rudiments of these sciences not because of the necessities of practical life a word for our most practical schools but because these are endowments belonging to the divine nature by a good method the teaching of these sciences may be made attractive and interesting so that no force may be required to compel youth to learn inspiration sequence in the development of body mind and soul were plato's modes of training the young citizen while his curriculum was surprisingly similar to that of our older colleges unfortunately there is preserved only a fragment of aristotle's writings on the art of teaching our knowledge of his opinions on the development of the mind being largely inferential from his works and from his intellectual ideals if these great greeks had recommended the youth of their country to devote ten of the formative years of their lives first to the mycenaean language and culture and second to the egyptian and mesopotamian languages and cultures then the few who still maintain that our modern youth should largely devote the formative period of their minds to ancient languages might rightfully claim to be classicists if there is such classical authority for the anti-classical movement it does not follow that the elimination of the substance has eliminated the spirit of medievalism from among the anti-classicists the true classicist may be one who follows most closely the highest classical models and these were certainly the models of the greeks both in their methods and in their achievements the greeks will be modern for all time and are still to be studied for the truest modern ideals for ideals which resulted in the most remarkable achievements in the way of centrifugal life that the world has known considering always the period and the infantile state of knowledge while anticipating us in the sciences in the extraordinary development of mathematics in the discovery of the evolution theory they gave ethics philosophy literature and science their foundation stones the destruction of the greek intellectual movement by political moral and social decay and by the loss of numerical and military supremacy set the intellectual progress of the world back two thousand years with the centrifugal greek spirit contrast the sentimentalism of the old educators in the renaissance of classical learning impelled partly by the extraordinary intrinsic or inherent force in such fragments of this learning as remained consider their sedentary life absorbed in poring over and discussing what aristotle and pliny had to say about the world rather than in travel and exploration of their own contrast their scrutiny of the books of the ancients rather than the book of nature herself their compilations in natural history with their dearth of observation of the objects about them of the birds the fishes flowers and even of human society this very overvaluation of classical literature and science inevitably brought the reaction of the great observing century which has just passed a reaction partly ending in a false modernism however which may have exceeded the limits prescribed by the truest modern spirit while we may abandon the claims for the classics of superior mind training value or of best conducing to a pure english style we may adhere to them as our most highly perfected disciplinary studies as developing systematic thinking as familiarizing us with a marvelous classic spirit as giving us a sense of perspective and proportion for our own lives and times as fundamentally associated with the technical language of biology and other sciences with all discoveries or centrifugal work in classical history art archaeology and philosophy the question is not as to the value of the classics but as to the part they shall play in the educational period old montaigne's epigram even to-day most truly expresses the real essence of the classical question no doubt both greek and latin are very great ornaments and of very great use but we buy them too dear there is also the reaction to the modern subject 
in the artillery fire against latin and greek in the smoke and confusion about elective and required courses the impression is abroad and the modern subject constitutes the essence of modernism as opposed to medievalism this is a dangerous half-truth for considering the diversity of subjects upon which the minds of great men have been bred down the ages is it not apparent that the essence of the matter must lie less in the subject than in the intellectual objective of the teacher and of the student do we not often observe the modern languages taught in a most intensely medieval fashion and the ancient languages under a different type of teacher as sources of a most modern spirit may not the classics be taught in such a way as to rapidly develop all the forces of education although such forces may be still more rapidly and readily developed through the sciences it is not a matter of fancy but of fact that despite clear perception of its special objective value the very teaching of science itself is still largely after the medieval dogmatic fashion and that even the verification of anatomical fact method of huxley has its dangers asymmetry and superficiality are the two words which sum up my criticism of our present american education from bottom to top swinging like a pendulum it has lost some of the merits of medievalism without attaining the full advantages of modernism accepting the general truth of huxley's brilliant if somewhat extreme contrast between the medieval and the modern spirit as quoted above we see that professed modernism in education still contains a large admixture of medievalism in its failure to develop the centrifugal forces of the mind such development was the essence of the greek spirit in education yet the modern spirit emphasizes even more than the greek the relation to the fellowmen not merely in the political but in every aspect in fact the essence of this spirit is service in matters of the mind it is intellectual altruism in education it is a training of the productive mind part two the art of the teacher what are the forces which are essential to the productive mind and what educational theory is most apt to develop them so far as intellectual progress is concerned and i am not now discussing religious moral or physical progress the first and most fundamental of these forces are in the nature of canons or standards they lie in the distinction of truth from error in the appreciation of beauty and fitness and in the application of these standards to thought together with our standards come our sources of knowledge and there arises as the first that of learning from the stores of tradition from books and the experience of man in our own and previous generations there follows close as a distinctively nineteenth-century source of knowledge that of direct observation of men and of nature then for the testing of our knowledge there is applied the triumphant crucible of human reason then our standards our knowledge and our reason seek expression in spoken and written language finally as the supreme human most closely approaching the superhuman power the six preceding forces lead to the production of new ideas and to all the forms of original activity this is the epitome at once of the universal both in intellect and in education truth beauty learning observation reason expression and production in their most comprehensive forms are the seven forces of progress and the factors of education are the processes of storage of these forces by cooperation of teacher and student the former with his constantly diminishing the latter with his constantly increasing responsibility the batteries become ready to discharge the potential intellectual energies ready to be liberated and the cunning business of art of the teacher consists in patience in alertness in ways means and methods in repairing or supplying deficiencies and discovering powers which are never actually to be idle as edward Seuss, the distinguished austin geologist recently observed in his farewell lecture and now i have reached the coma when i became a teacher i did not cease to be a student and now that i cease to be a teacher i shall not cease to be a student as long as my eyes see my ears hear and my hands can grasp with this wish i do not step out but take up my former position looking for a moment to our social obligations it would appear possible to cultivate the first five of these forces in a monastic existence totally without benefit to one's fellowmen to acquire liberal culture 
without effect or result, except for its possessor, to attain an individual mastery of truth and beauty, of learning, of observation, and of reasoning as purely receptive or centripetal powers. In contrast, the last two forces of expression and production are the centrifugal application of knowledge, by their very terms altruistic and marking the purpose of education, the service of our fellows, in commerce, in art, in politics, in literature, in scientific discovery, in every form of human activity. To learn to produce, to be of service, we must, with Huxley, discern to the full the special role of each factor and, at the same time, secure a balance. The balance enforcement of the heptalogue is as essential to the perfectly educated man as the balance working of the great system of organs is to the ideal bodily development. The attainment of symmetry will always baffle us, because of the generally inborn or constitutional asymmetry of mind, because of the limitations and predispositions of pupils and students, one having the gift for truth, another for beauty, another for learning, another for observation, another for reason, another for expression, another for creative production, and the many having no special gifts whatsoever. Only rarely are the largest number of these gifts in the larger measure combined in what we call the youth of genius, and only that educator will rightly serve his calling, who holds in his charitable heart this law of the mental variability of the race, who suspects the existence of talents out of the direct line of his own sympathies, who hopefully foresees that the dance in mathematics may become the brilliant biologist, that the defective memory may be housed in the same brain with the keen reasoning power, that the deficient linguist may metamorphose into the brilliant observer, that the listless youth of eighteen may exhibit the spirit of the daring explorer at thirty, that the Roland who leaves the small New England college in disgust may become the leading American physicist, that the Darwin who loiters through Cambridge may revolutionize the thought of the world. Even my own experience with students yields instances of an inborn predilection for a certain subject walking a marvellous metempsychosis. A careless student, in the search for an elective involving the irreducible minimum of effort, perhaps by the toss of a coin, elects a subject which, because of an atavistic, though previously unsuspected impulse, fascinates and transforms him for life. Herein lies often the failure of the more rigid and restricted curriculum, and the success of the miscellaneous fire of many electives or aimless discontinuity of studies, that among the repeated shots one may hit the bull's eye of intellectual predisposition and thus discover the man. By focusing our attention upon each in turn in the light of the wisdom of our own and preceding centuries, we may best discover the special parts played by each of the seven factors of education individually ineffective collectively an irresistible power. Factors of Truth and Beauty Again, many of you think it is not only a waste of time, but a positive sin to read novels and poetry and general literature, to cultivate in any way the imagination, to take an interest in painting or sculpture or music. You have yet to learn that although parrots and other imitative animals can get on without imagination, there is no such thing in existence as an unimaginative scientific man. That you have some imagination and individuality is evidenced by your differentiation from all other students of science classes. But have you these well developed, and have you those other qualities which are absolutely necessary for the success of a scientific worker? Imagination is far and away the most important. But there are also judgment and common sense, and the love of truth and the power of self-sacrifice, which seem always to accompany the pursuit of science. The divine order of truth and beauty, as conceived by Plato, is at the foundation of all things and forms the soul of education. For a truthless education is fruitless, and an education without the sense of beauty and harmony fails, both of its imaginative elements and of its full effect on other men. The inspiration of these standards and basal guiding qualities is through religion, the study of the beauty and harmony of nature, of classical and modern literature, of art, led by the personal influence of men of culture and productive capacity. Intellectual virtue, the truth canon, the first ingredient of education, must be derived from some source or other, 
virtue and knowledge not necessarily run on all fours many conspicuous instances could be cited of their absolute divorce and with huxley in his romaine's lecture i am not hopeful of deriving moral qualities from the study of pure science such virtues are often derivable from religious ideals but this is certainly not universally the case because of the large ingredient of faith in religion it is aside from our present path to consider whether the aesthetic factor was more or less appreciated by medievalists than by moderns the art spirit has certainly suffered a decline since the renaissance the spirit of the florentines was most nearly a revival of the greek spirit which the world has seen the sense of the beautiful combined with the appreciation of natural law as manifested in leonardo da vinci enters into scientific no less than into artistic education and the cultivation of the imagination is as much the constructive basis of the physical sciences as of literature in the relative spheres of the essential union or separateness of ethical and aesthetic cultivation we are again on debatable ground as will be readily seen from the comparison of the latin environment abounding from childhood in aesthetic cultivation while perhaps less insistent upon the element of truth with the german english and american in short with teutonic environment relatively deficient in the sense of beauty while perhaps more insistent on the element of truth the factor of learning with this close hold upon practical life and this constant interest in the politics of the world especially of england and the united states no man could be less like that cloistered student who is commonly taken as a typical man of learning but lord acton was a miracle of learning of the sciences of nature and their practical applications in the arts he has indeed no more knowledge than any cultivated man of the world is expected to possess but of all the so-called human subjects his mastery was unequalled learning was the business of his life he was gifted with a singularly tenacious memory the passion for acquiring knowledge which his german education had fostered ended by becoming a snare for him because it checked his productive powers it absorbed so much of his time that little was left for literary composition it made him think that he could not write on a subject till he had read everything or nearly everything that others had written about it the middle centuries were distinctively the period of learning the great and enduring contribution of medievalism to the world and to modern education was its insatiable thirst for information for knowledge of the achievements of man as set forth in books and book lore for literature and for the traditional science of the greeks and romans as harris aptly expressed it through learning we stand on the shoulders of all previous generations and figuratively speaking the survival of medievalism is only to be deplored in the one great feature of its faith that a secure position on other men's shoulders is of paramount importance and constitutes an end rather than a beginning and an accompaniment of education the learned attitude is naturally the historian's attitude toward education we have cited above the late lord acton as a modern medievalist of the highest type of vast learning of limited production as a storage battery which rarely discharges as a life illuminating our present contention by way of contrast to acton may be instanced among historians our own fisk browning tennyson victor hugo and above all balzac as pouring the forces of learning into expression into the conversations debates and discussions of their men and women or into the pages of history in his brief but great preface to per Goriot, in which balzac lays bare the whole philosophy of la comedie humaine he shows thorough conversance with the whole biological movement of his times beginning with buffon of the middle of the eighteenth century and ending with the famous discussions between cuvier and saint hilaire of the early nineteenth all a matter of pure and well-digested learning it may be said that his works fairly bristle with learning and knowledge and that acquisition was one of the great elements of his genius similarly tennyson's in memoriam shows a remarkable comprehension of modern biology in its many more open and more subtle allusions to evolution and heredity our shelves are loaded with the books of unlearned men i have in mind two remarkably original works of recent times they have justly brought their authors great renown yet they both fail at the critical point where the authors extend from their specialties and attempt to reach out for broader conclusions in neighboring fields of knowledge conclusions which are rendered totally invalid 
almost ridiculous through deficiency in biological and anthropological learning learning necessarily occupies a vast amount of time and it is a false modernism which depreciates its place in education how near-sighted are certain reactions against it how absurd the fads of certain ultra-modern schools how out of time the premature exclusive specialization how inadequate the extreme laboratory system even in the university how futile to attempt to educate exclusively through research as emerson observes whatever force may have compelled us to education we are always gravitating back to learning to the accumulated knowledge of our subject and this is one of the most striking phases in the self-education of men we recall that aristotle opens every disquisition with a review of all that was known and said by his predecessors that this is the well-known method of introducing the doctorate thesis in germany we recall that darwin although eventually more learned in books than any scientific man of his generation neglected book knowledge while at cambridge and after becoming attracted to science by observation and discovering how largely it is necessary to draw from the recorded observations of others was fairly forced back to book knowledge fine proves these that the teacher should fairly stoop to conquer that he should fascinate the student with the spirit of some principal subject that interest once enlisted the value and necessity of book knowledge become apparent the factor of observation you know much of what has been done but have you the power to discover to add to the world's knowledge your knowledge has been derived from books and lectures you have now to learn that a week in the laboratory during which you seem to crawl during which for examination purposes you do less than in reading ten lines of a textbook is really of more value to your scientific education than a month's hard reading this is almost unbelievable to you who are such adepts in passing examinations yet it is quite true lectures and lessons have spoon-fed you until now lectures and lessons will in future teach you to feed yourselves but how willingly i would as a poet exchange some of this slumbering ponderous helpless knowledge of books for some experience of life and man schopenhauer's premise that all truth and wisdom lie ultimately in observation we find reflected in the lives of men of science and of letters a very thirst for transition from book learning to original and direct observation of men of facts and things of nature as inexhaustible sources of new knowledge the reciprocal relations or the actions and reactions between learning and observation are wonderfully illustrated in the life of pasteur the noblest scientific life recorded again when young ramonica hall while a medical student found in works of reference no citation from his own countrymen he resolved that if it lay in his power at least one spanish name should appear in the history of medicine of the future and remove the reproach of spain he threw himself with ardor not into deeper and more extensive learning but into the observation of the nervous system by means of a method which had just been discovered by the Italian histologist Golgi, and with such success that in the course of a few years every anatomical treatise quoted the brilliant discoveries of Cajal from the ancient university of Cordova. This truism that the world holds its own by learning, that it moves forward by observation, is a distinctive gift of the scientific spirit to education. It has not yet become a truism of educational practice, quick and keen in children undoubtedly inherited from our very remote ancestral life where powers of observation were factors in survival this faculty was unrecognized in the medieval system of education and is also unknown to the college which ignores the element of observation in its requirements both for admission and for honors at graduation it is therefore largely ignored in the school which prepares for the college a condition of things which however is widely perceived and rapidly being remedied in the public secondary schools of this country here i may quote from a noteworthy recent address by the headmaster of one of the most successful colleges of england the school preparation should be of a kind which will foster the desire and develop the power to overcome difficulties it should give self-reliance and sufficient knowledge of scientific principles to enable the pupil in after life to understand changing conditions and see their trend above all school work should encourage the spirit of inquiry which finds delight in making new observations and experiments with whatever resources are available the principle upon which humboldt constructed prussian education a century ago was whatever we wish to see characteristic of our nation we must first implant in our schools assuredly if we would prepare our scholars for life the supreme intellectual preparation is found in methods which evoke the faculty 
the originality, the mental resourcefulness of our pupils. It is for us to see that the subjects and methods of teaching in our schools are such as to promote the development of these qualities, for national progress depends upon them. School and college should, from the outset, foster this most fertile of natural faculties. The postponement of observation to the graduate school, where it naturally enjoys its maximum cultivation, is a hazardous experiment, because of the law of degeneration of unused mental powers. What we observe is less vital than that we do observe, and the introduction of science in the school should be less for knowledge and learning than for facility in vision and elementary reasoning. Observable material is what is called for, not always the same material, neither is it necessarily in the scientific. It may be in the poetical, literary, classical sphere. In the social world, the young observer is most admirably advised by Montaigne. This great world which some do yet multiply as several species under one genus is the mirror wherein we are to behold ourselves, to be able to know ourselves, as we ought to do in true bias. In short, I would have this to be the book my young gentleman should study with the most attention. So the several fragments he borrows from others he will transform and shuffle together to compile work that shall be absolutely his own, that is to say, his judgment his instruction, labor, and study tend to nothing else but to form that. He is not obliged to discover whence he got the materials that have assisted him, but only to produce what he has himself done with them. The Factor of Reason That man, I think, has had a liberal education, who has been so trained in youth, that his body is the ready servant of his will, and does with ease and pleasure all the work that, as a mechanism, it is capable of whose intellect is a clear, cold logic engine, with all its parts of equal strength and in smooth working order, ready, like a steam engine, to be turned to any kind of work and spin the cosmos as well as forge the anchors of the mind, whose mind is stored with the knowledge of the great and fundamental truths of nature and of all the laws of your operations, one who, no stunted ascetic, is full of life and fire, but whose passions are trained to come to heal by a vigorous will, the servant of a tender conscience, who has learnt to love all beauty, whether of nature or of art, to hate all vileness, and to respect others as himself. Huxley Reason is the great asset of man. Granted the impulses of beauty, of truth, of knowledge, and of observation, there is still to be trained this efficient logic engine of thought, so wonderfully pictured by Huxley. George Meredith also speaks in inimitable style of the relation of observation to reason and discrimination. Observers of a gathering complication and a character in action commonly resemble gleaners who are intent only on picking up the ears of grain and huddling their store. Disinterestedly or interestedly, they wax over-eager for the little trifles and make too much of them. Observers should begin upon the precept that not all we see is worth hoarding, and that the things we see are to be weighed in the scale with what we know of the situation before we commit ourselves to a measurement. And they may be accurate observers without being good judges. They do not think so, and their bent is to glean hurriedly and form conclusions as hasty when their business should be sift at each step and question. Nature is not over-liberal with this asset. She often richly endows with all other forces, while most parsimonious with this. Two of my older scientific colleagues, most learned, most gifted observers, profound students, able writers, and prolific producers, were yet almost devoid of the power of sound logic. On one occasion, after examining their joint advocacy of a certain theory, which I myself strongly entertained at the time, I could not help remarking, Heaven preserve us from our friends. Scientific common sense, or the absence of it, is congenital. It comes from our forebears, or from that strange benefactress, the saltation in heredity. If not inborn, this break in the ranks must be perceived and so far as possible repaired by the teacher, certainly one of the most difficult, if not most hopeless, of tasks. The induction into correct thinking is not only in formal logic, in philosophy, in the history of the sciences, more especially where taught by personal contact and discussion between master and student, but in the continuous exercise or practice of reasoning by the student himself, guided by kindly but expert criticism of the master in every branch of original thinking. 
here is where mathematics and the natural sciences make their most effective contributions to education in affording the data for reasoning from problem to solution or from cause to effect in its simpler forms there is no abbreviated formula for reading nature or men at sight the invention of the guesses that make an hypothesis the trials of the hypothesis that make a theory and the discarding of the theories that fall for a truth in brief the unerring scent on the track of new truth can only be acquired by the method of trial and error guided by skilful and ingenious advice the factor of expression for my part i venture to doubt the wisdom of attempting to mould one's style by any other process than that of striving after the clear and forcible expression of definite conceptions in which the glassian precept first catch your definite conceptions is probably the most difficult to obey but still i mark among distinguished contemporary speakers and writers of english saturated with antiquity not a few of whom it seems to me the study of hopes might have taught dignity of swift concision and clearness of goldsmith and defoe simplicity huxley all men stand in need of expression in love in art in politics in labor in games we study to utter our secret the man is only half himself the other half is his expression emerson why with lycidas shun delights and live laborious days why acquire the canons of truth and taste the familiarity with achievement if you cannot bring forth discoveries and ideas which may have cost you an infinite amount of labor if you have not the power of expression in language drawing painting sculpture architecture or other forms of design while considering expression as covering every form of the conveyance of ideas to others here we may speak only of the written form the gist of huxley's famous sentence quoted above is that ideas practice and the native literature are the three chief factors in the cultivation of style in language look to the best lay writers of england to huxley himself as well as to the uniformly fine style developed in france and avoid germany as you would avoid a labyrinth or a quicksand the medieval spirit instilled in prejudice to the mother tongue was manifested in the writing of the bible and all works of science in latin it survives in over-reliance upon latin and greek in the cultivation of the art of expression in this day when two great exponents of english style huxley with little early classical training and tyndall chiefly of scientific education stand shoulder to shoulder with two other masters of prose maurice and goldwin smith both of classical education when darwin and galton are models of simplicity and clearness we cannot believe that they can survive a classical monopoly for the acquisition of style latin is said to be enjoying a great revival in the secondary schools of america but the classics as generally taught with us fail to have the productive and constructive value in expression which is enforced in england where style is cultivated and developed by a constant interchange of classical and english expression at eton for example the training culminates in the ability to put a times editorial into greek or latin with us the chief regime of classical preparation consists in translation passing translation and in true medieval spirit some of the most progressive colleges have been piling up reading requirements in raising the standard of admission as the entrance examination approaches translation increases in quantity and intensity for two years there is a long and arduous cram until the average student becomes fairly surfeited with the very masterpieces of literature and as thoroughly cured of any taste for the classics as the israelites were of any partiality for manner the transfer of a large proportion if not of the entire classical training from the culture period of college life to the more purely disciplinary period of school life is also one of the most conspicuous illustrations of what has been spoken of above as retrogression in the guise of progress happily however expression is the one direction in which a substantial advance has been made in american college education in the last two decades under wise leadership in this art we far outclass the germans but still lag behind the french if we are gaining expression all the more need to follow more ardently the glassian precept to gather our ideas and harvest our observations so that we may bring them forth into the final stage of original production the factor of production i do not propose for a moment to invite you to blink the fact that our huge anglo-saxon array of producers and readers and especially our vast cis-atlantic multitude presents production 
uncontrolled, production untouched by criticism, unguided, unlighted, uninstructed, unashamed, on a scale that is really a new thing in the world. It is all a complete reversal of any proportion between the elements that was ever seen before. The Lesson of Balzac, Henry James The stirring appeal and command of Carlyle for production should be carved in stone over the portals of every school, college, and university, and embodied in the precepts of every teacher, because production, as a foremost intellectual service to God and to man, and as the end of the whole educational system, should be prepared for by instilling the true modern spirit into every course in school and college. The word is used advisedly for all activities of the artisan, as well as of the artist, because there are as many who can produce in some form as there are few who can create. The vast majority of men are born consumers. There are few who are either instinct with a desire to produce, or who have had the vast hiatus between consumption and production impressed upon them. Many clever people fail to grasp the distinction. In the metropolis of America, for instance, we consume vast quantities of the foreign intellectual product, the music, the art, the literature. And the metropolitan, in his heart, thinks that we are a musical, an artistic, or a literary people, whereas we may lay small claim to any one of these attributes until, in these commodities of the mind, our exports equal or exceed in quality our imports. There is in America at large, outside of the great field of mechanical endeavor, a singular blindness to the supreme importance of productive and creative work, to the fact, as Henry James observes, that the quality of our production in philosophy, politics, political administration, in law, medicine, literature, in pure or applied science, in whatever you will, is the one absolute criterion of the nation's intellectual standing. As a recent writer has said, invention abounds, discovery is rare. The inventor enjoys a national reputation and a niche in the Hall of Fame. The discoverer often enjoys an undisturbed obscurity, and looks for his recognition not in his own country, but in the older countries of Europe, where the value of discovery is appreciated. There is a similar blindness, even where there is less excuse for it, in our schools, colleges, and universities, as to the prolonged, broad, and profound training which must precede and accompany production in any branch of human endeavor. Again, we may quote from Suez's farewell address. In the course of the years I have seen and experienced much. At the beginning a man has honestly to endeavor with zeal, and with certain restrictions upon himself, to learn the detail and sometimes the hair whitens before he is in a position to obtain a general view and to risk a first synthetic attempt. This first step to synthesis is, however, the deciding step in the life of the inquirer. Soon he notes that his judgment obtains more consideration among his collaborators. He becomes more careful and conservative with the same. And finally the hour arrives in which his soul is filled with the highest satisfaction, because he has been able to add to human knowledge some new view or a new fact, a feeling over against which everything naturally vanishes that the outer world is able to offer in acknowledgment. The initial step in the schooling for production is what is familiarly known as the original exercise, which may begin in the kindergarten and terminate in the most advanced laboratory. The whole centrifugal process is the same in kind, while it differs infinitely in degree. In classics, it is the turning of English into Latin and Greek. In mathematics, it is the original problem. In English, it is the theme. In science, the induction from the observed experiment, however simple. In brief, it is the outflow from the mind, rather than the inflow to the mind. The acquisition of the centrifugal, rather than the centripetal power. Thus are taken the rudimentary, the intermediate, as well as all the successive steps, from the simplest to the very highest grades of production. I fancy the instinct that this is the real purpose and end of education has been the more or less unconscious inspiration of every great teacher of all time. It is the most difficult part of education. It is the point where students rebel most. It is the point where the largest number of teachers fail. It is the method which is most difficult to prescribe. It is the fine memory, bringing the highest collegiate honors and standing combined with the inability to produce, 
which results in the barren afterlife and wonder as to the worth of the first diploma. It is far easier to compel a student to read six books of Homer than to train him to turn one page of English properly into Greek. It is far easier to learn by rote Tennyson's In Memoriam than to produce one line worthy of a place in that great poem. It is far easier to memorize Darwin's entire origin of species than to devise a single new biological experiment of real value. Efficiency, constructiveness, productiveness are the ascendic democratic species of the aristocratic genus creation. There are corresponding gradations in the training of the efficient man, of the constructive man, of the productive man, leading to that of the creative man. The same in kind, but of great difference in degree. The grade is always determined by the nature and response of the mind itself to the opportunities or intellectual and social environment which is offered to the mind. Even the centripetal system of education cannot crush out the passion for creative work which is born in some men and women, but since the mission of education is itself production, it must produce the producers, it must discover them and trade them to the highest as well as to the intermediate or the lower planes of creative work. Once inoculated with this virus, education enjoys a new vitality and immunity to ennui. The centrifugal power, inborn or instilled, turns into those channels which taste and opportunity unfold, into science, literature, theology, law, medicine, commerce, manufacture, politics. Conceit is checked and humility engendered by learning what has been achieved and the supreme difficulty attending achievement. What I am contending for is that the one absolute essential in all education is to hold out the centrifugal life of originality, of efficiency, of construction, of production, of creation, as the chief end of education, rather than to make any of the subsidiary factors, such as intellectual morality, or learning, or reasoning, or the cultivation of taste, or the power of expression, ends in themselves. Let master and student be impatient of the systems which postpone production until after years of learning and acquisition through brilliancy of memory give a false sense of power. Rather from the outset learn and think to do. Be not impatient of the slowness of the process of acquiring either the power of production or of the many complex factors which enter into it. This is an outline of the universal principles which illuminate the largest as well as the most detailed problems of education. Whatever the grade of instruction, whatever the subject, whether in science or literature, whatever the choice of profession, we may always find our path lighted by the same signals, and ask whether a symmetrical development of the seven factors is being brought about. Every great subject has within it the possibility of developing the seven factors, but a combination of subjects selected with reference to their special influences may bring about this development to the greatest advantage, for there are studies to stimulate the imagination, others to develop the memory and power of learning, others to facilitate observation, others reason, and so on. The universal illuminants remain both as the guide and the single basis of criticism of the teacher, of the course, of the curriculum, of the institution, of the student himself, of his most elementary thoughts, and of his most advanced original contributions. Henry Fairfield Osborne, Columbia University End of Seven Factors of Education by Henry Fairfield Osborne Seven Processes of Language From the Swain School Lectures by Andrew Ingram This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Seven processes of language. Where is the English language? This question seems to imply a misuse of the word where, unless indeed one means in what localities on earth speakers of English are found. But this is not my meaning. Why not then ask the question in such a way as to convey your meaning? Because I cannot, and yet if I only knew how. Perhaps after hearing the seven different answers that I give to this question, you may discern more clearly than at present that we lack an interrogative of a signification more general than that of where. Where, then, is the English language? On innumerable bits of paper, parchment, papyrus, wood, stone, metal, and other material, in nearly every land under the sun, 
there it exists to-day as some of it has been existing at any moment in these last eight hundred years yes much of it has been existing in this way for more than eight hundred years shading off in place and time into other languages without number so that it is hard to say where the english language ends and where something else begins some language that it is not english it may seem singular to you that our copious english has no word to stand for this manifestation of itself this is the seen language the visible language the language that is or may be read i might call it the lect i want a term that shall draw your attention away from the mode in which the lect is produced and make prominent the fact only that we use our eyes to recognize it with and that is something which fails to be expressed by the phrases written language printed engraved or typewritten language there it is reposing in thousands of libraries or moving from place to place over the great land and ocean highways of the world an incessant stream which swells from year to year its eddies sprinkling your desk with letters every morning picture to yourself this universe of script and print and inscription does it not seem as if man had added a new realm to nature every one that has eyes can see this language and few suspect their liability to confound it with anything else where it is all can learn but what it is its origin its changes its relation to other phenomena both in and out of language are matters that few may understand here a character that stands for a single sound and again for a group of sounds and here one that represents a whole word or sentence and another that does not stand for a sound at all but for some idea here again characters that have ceased to stand for anything and there others that never did stand for anything this english has a story of its own and most stubbornly has it resisted the most persistent efforts to mould it into new forms which would establish a one-to-one -one correspondence of itself to some other series but let me pass to one of these other series leaving this first and simplest answer to my question where is the english language that it is found inside english but here is another answer the English language exists, at this instant, in multitudinous movements of the particles of the air, vibrations and oscillations, as we call them, exists for a moment and disappears as rapidly as it is called into being, exists in this way over a greater part of the earth's surface than any other language. In this state of existence it is not discernible by any one of our senses, but only inferable from certain indications that our senses furnish but we can picture to ourselves the unsensible that is the invisible the inaudible the intangible in imagination and very curious hardly recognizable not even surmised to exist by many is this language of ours which floats in the air around us or like the snow falls in the river a moment white then melts forever or like the borealis rays that fleet ere you can point their place or like the rainbow's lovely form a vanishing amid the storm have you ever tried to represent to yourself the english language as it must exist between you and me in the air there if it is ever to get from you to me or from me to you if you have ever made the effort to imagine the space between us while we are talking to each other there can be no limit to your admiration for the genius of Helmholtz the great philosopher of our century eminent as mathematician as physicist and as physiologist the newton of the nineteenth century who has done in our time for sound what that great investigator did in the seventeenth century for light no poet or priest can reveal these mysteries to us we cannot expect him to concentrate his gaze on a cubic yard of air and to experiment reason and calculate till he can not merely assert but prove his assertion that thus it is in that cube of air and not otherwise poet and seer may desire to know what holds the earth together in its inmost sphere see whence production has its birth see all the germs of life appear but his emotions unfit him for pursuing the only cause that will lead to a result independent of his individual impressions on the other hand a scientist a Helmholtz, takes his stand nor swerves till he triumphs over the secret hid in that volume of air 
and tells the story of how he did it all in that huge book of his so that any one of our or of any after time can if he will hear the atmosphere's story told and know that not only did such things take place once but that they take place now whenever you supply the specified conditions just consider a moment it has long been known that the duration of any sound i utter has for its counterpart or correlative a continuation of air waves one following the other that the pitch of any sound i utter has for its counterpart the rapidity with which the wave passes a certain point or the number of wave crests that pass that point in a second that the loudness of any sound i utter is represented out there in the air by the degree of condensation of the wave sounds may differ in pitch in loudness in duration but sounds differ from one another in so many other particulars all this natura sonans this sonant nature this world of sounds this inexhaustible quarry for singer and musician and poet does it have a corresponding natura vibrans a vibrant nature a world of vibrations in the air that surrounds us we surely distinguish ball from keen even when both sounds having the same duration the same pitch the same intensity go along with air waves that have the same duration the same rapidity the same degree of condensation what is there then in the air that answers to this difference between ball and keen this is the question which Humboldt asks himself and to which he found an answer an illustration drawn from another source may make the answer plainer not indeed in its detail and exactitude will not tell you just what there is in air english that matches ball and keen but will tell you what is the character of that something this is the illustration look out on the ocean you see a line of billows from crest to crest more than a vessel's length over the surface of these swelling billows climb waves flitting over the waves as this sweep over the billows are troops of wavelets and there you see a swirl of eddies scurrying over and amid these little waves and wifts of ripples dance over the whole and run into the dizziest whirl of foam now something like this is going on in the air and it is these eddies and ripples among the air waves the aerial vibration in other words that we find the counterpart of that which makes the sonorous difference between ball and keen homer speaks of epea pteroenta winged words and i am inclined to think that this epithet was then more scientific than poetic how could he account for the fact that the word went from me to you more satisfactorily to himself than by supposing that it had invisible wings to bear it away but we know that it is not the word that goes but simply curiously intricate pulsations of the air but it is not in the air alone that this vibrationary english exists walls chairs tables windows wires but why enumerate your fire screen there comports itself very differently in the presence of a frenchman let me assure you from its behaviour when an englishman calls in the air between two persons who are talking together in a room in the court by which they communicate when they use that toy called a lover's telegraph in the wire that stretches miles in length from one telephone to another exists this vibration english it is essentially the same in all the phonograph simply sets up the same motions in the air that were originally produced by the mouth that talked into it and in passing let me observe that english exists in one of its forms on the cylinder of the phonograph though i had not included this in my enumeration of the places or states in which the english language is found the mouth that talked into it i said and this brings me to a third whereabouts of english let me call it physiological english for the nonce though mouth english is a more significant term suppose that while an englishman is speaking it were possible to take instantaneous photographs every few seconds of the whole articulatory apparatus we should have a series of picture which would be as significant to one who had studied it as our written english is and that series of motions which these pictures would in part represent of palate tongue teeth lips would if we could interpret it be as definite an expression of the speaker's meaning as are the words we hear why the successive positions of those organs of speech which are visible suffice alone to enable those who have studied these indications to catch the speaker's meaning but there is no doubt that the whole language every hue and tinge and shade of it is paralleled by this series of positions of the vocal organs 
the study of these facts forms part of the science of phonetics there are diagrams which are intended to show the various positions the articulatory apparatus assumes when pronouncing the sounds indicated by the letters more attention is now given to this physiological english than ever before with this result among others that a difference has been detected among sounds supposed to be alike when once the attention has been directed to a difference of position in the organs by which the sounds were made on the other hand sounds between which no difference can be discerned have been shown to be producible in a number of different ways that is by different motions of the articulating parts it is on this physiological english that the visible speech of mr alexander graham bell is based every letter of this alphabet represents not as in ordinary alphabets a certain sound but that position of the parts of the mouth by which this sound is made the startling originality of this conception was well matched by the patience and assiduity which worked it out in detail and in his studies of this other english this mouth english which we all use without noticing it lies the germ of the invention of his now more famous son graham bell it was by dropping those Englishes with which we are all familiar, and taking up those with which we are not habitually occupied at all, that visible speech and the telephone were worked out. Vibration English and mouth English, things that most Englishmen know nothing about, have, when once the attention of competent persons was fixed upon them, revolutionized the methods of instructing deaf-mutes, began to change all our processes of teaching languages made it possible for a traveller to take down the speech of a barbarian stranger with such exactness that his correspondent can reproduce it with the greatest fidelity and enabled boston and new york to converse together with as much ease as you and i in this room but we may enlarge our conception of mouth english since the whole organism reacts in some degree in response to the action of any part it follows that english is in a peculiar sense embodied in the children of english-speaking parents all the testimony of all the statistics in the world would not convince me that an english-born babe would not learn english more easily than an infant of french parentage placed in the same surroundings this brings us to the english language existing as a nerve process or rather as a twofold nerve process corresponding to the double attitude of hearer and speaker yes a fourthfold nerve process when we take into account reader and writer as well no physiologist doubts that something different is going on in the brain when one writes and when one speaks when one hears and when one reads sometimes one of these faculties is impaired without immediately involving an impairment of either of the other this led tecmer to recommend the separate and distinct learning of the spoken and the written language associate that is to say the spoken word with a meaning and the written word with a meaning and not as is usually the case in schools associate the spoken and the written word as languages are now learned aphasia or an affection of the nerves that makes talking impossible involves agraphia or the inability to write down one's thoughts according to tecmer's plan the one of these would not be necessarily complicated with the other but not in visible signs not in air or any vibratory medium not in nerve or in the reactions of the organism not in the successive position of the articulatory organs not in any of these can the language be said so truly to exist as in this very world of universe of sounds themselves here language lives and moves and yet all the names that are applied to this to this succession of sounds are taken from something associated with this succession and have misleading suggestions instance the english tongue the english language lingua the english speech is somewhat better the english talk if we could use the expression directs our attention still better to the sound itself and withdraws it more easily from the tongue the teeth the air the ear the letters the perpetual accompaniment in nature and in thought of these sounds it is a sad reflection that these the spoken language has been crowded out of men's thoughts by the written language there can of course be no likeness between these only a correspondence this correspondence may have any degree of exactness in no language however is the correspondence very exact in english it is very inexact changes of stress of pitch of pause of duration of individual utterance are not marked at all 
Even what is left of the sound after deducting all this is either under-indicated, or over-indicated, or misindicated, or when indicated, indicated in a very unpractical and inelegant manner. Tennyson laments, as he composes his verses, that the subtle succession of sounds he has sought to seize cannot be preserved, can hardly be expressed by the symbols he tries to represent them by. Luckily, the world clings to the bad, and it is hard to change all this. Luckily, I say, for how else can we hope that they will cling to the good when they get it? This half-century has indeed witnessed a glorious revival, a veritable renaissance of the sounds of the Latin and Greek languages. Even the long, silent rhythms of the latter have awakened to life. Order, symmetry, and beauty have been discovered where all was confusion. But who would undertake to reconstruct our rhythms from the texts of today, with no other key to them than the texts themselves? The English language has numerous faults at its best, and many of these our schools have done their utmost to perpetuate. But, by and large, there is no language fitted to cope with the English in the struggle of existence from the simple fact that the English represents the highest stage of linguistic development, and all progress in other languages is toward the English type. Were it not for the utterly indefensible difficulties of our orthography, we would have made even the thought of such a thing as volapic impossible. But my aim was an exposition, not an argument, still less a declamation. But there is another English that awaits attention. What, says someone, this complex of sounds and sights and air pulses and walking jaws and nerve tremors, singly or all put together, is that what you call English? Would the sounds sky, river, bird, tree, moon, and so forth be English, be language at all, if no thoughts went along with them? And does not the English language exist in this thought series? The reviews make sport of Professor Max Muller's assertion that language is thought, that there is, there can be, no thought without language, that, in effect, if there were no word tree or some such symbol, there would be no tree for us. Professor Max Muller, I grant, has many thoughts, for which it would be hard for anyone, even for the professor himself, to find any scientific foundation. Such was his unfortunate Turanian group of languages. Such was the notion which he shared with his time, that the Indo-Europeans had their origin in Asia. Such was his theory, not his alone, of the three stages in the development of language. Such was his theory of mythology, and his reconstruction of the religious past. Deduct all these things, and even more, we can still leave him his contention that language is thought, and thought is language. Not that even here his doctrine needs not to be pruned of many excrescences, and its exposition translated into the language of another system of thought than his own. What is worth retaining of this doctrine, somewhat paradoxically expressed, without language nor thought? The change has been from homogeneous to heterogeneous, from indefinite to definite, from incoherent to coherent. I use Spencer's terms to express a fact that is admitted by all, without committing myself to their implications in the Spencerian philosophy. Now a mind that is, at any stage of that process, does violence, as it were to itself, to retrace its course, to rethink what it has outgrown. What is it that has given our thoughts their present arrangement, has made there to be thoughts at all? What, by social intercourse, communication, and that which makes communication possible, language? Consider your experience of sights, colours, odours, stars, clouds, suns, moons, meteors, tempests, lightnings, thunders, that rush of ever-changing sensations that makes up one of the strands of life from infancy to maturity. Were it not that you have the word sky, how would you discern its meaning amid this cluster of impressions? Is it not this word that gives unity to that experience? Pass and review all the times when you have heard that word, all the myriads of sentences into which it has entered. Remember that you did not look up the meaning of the word in the dictionary, that you did not get at it through the medium of other words, that it was not told to you, but that you have been going on guessing more or less consciously what English speakers mean by that word. In time, that symbol, that sound, sky, groups and connects and unifies and substantializes all these elements, makes of them a coherent whole, 
which, in the absence of such a connecting link, would have lain dispersed and disordered in the mind. Words, says Sir William Hamilton, are nothing but signs for the factitious unities of thought. Factitious, mark the word, signs, not for things, but for what we have put together and agreed to call things. That, perhaps, is all that things are. Why we have put some experiences together, and connected them by a name, and not put other things together in thought, nor connected them by a name, is a question which it is almost useless for anyone to attack, who has not an acquaintance with many languages and many minds. It should be the aim of some school to supply these conditions, and by neither attacking nor defending, in the present confusion, any single doctrine to enable men to see of what elements it consists and what is its range. Survey the scene that our minds present. We ascribe reality to what our names stand for. Adam probably thought, till he learned better, that the monkeys on the limb were a part of the tree, and gave foolishly enough a single name to what he mistook for a unity. We find it difficult to believe that our own minds are merely bundles of just such Adamitic conceptions. We do not often have occasion to speak, as of an individual whole, of the group of phenomena involved or connected in the transit of a negro over a rail fence with a melon under his arm while the moon is just passing behind a cloud. But if this collocation of phenomena were of frequent occurrence, and if we did have occasion to speak of it often, and if its happening were likely to affect the money market, we should have some name as Wuzin to denote it by. People would in time be disputing whether the existence of Wuzin involved necessarily a rail fence, and whether the term could be applied when a white man was similarly related to a stone wall. Let us not flatter ourselves that we have no such words in our minds, centers of crystallization around which are grouped our own concepts which we mistake for realities. Yes, reality is such a word, mind is such a word, English is such a word. After all, the phases of existence which I have attributed to the English language, Sin English, Air English, Mouth English, Nerve English, Sound English, Sense English, I fear that I shall have to admit, on nearer and closer scrutiny, that what we call English does not exist at all. English is an abstraction from a multitude of individuals and particulars. Does Banyanese exist? Where shall we find Carlyle's? If a book should be found, and one man should contend that Bunyan wrote it, and another should deny this, each would assume the existence of some standard of Bunyanese by which the question might be decided. If you have ever read such controversies, and used your best endeavour to find out what was Bunyanese of A, and what the Bunyanese of B, and what the real Bunyanese, the only one that would satisfy your love of truth, you might come to question whether there was such a thing as Bunyanese after all. And now take that much wider abstraction, the English language. Here is a name. It stands for something in my mind and in yours. Whether the two agree or not, we have not many opportunities of ascertaining. Now what is the signification of your name? Can you give me any test by which what is English is, without fail, discriminated from what is not English? I have been looking and hearkening for this English at intervals my life long. All I can find is a scrap here, a bit there, and the English language I fear I shall never get to hear or to see or to know. Or shall I say of it, as St. Augustine says, of time? Ask me what English is, I do not know. Do not ask me, I know. This general, this abstract, this ideal English, this standard which most appear to think exists somewhere, though few can agree as to where it is to be found, we may almost conclude that it never has existed, does not exist now, and never will exist till the pure and true is established among men. Let us now briefly recapitulate, though in a different order. We may place at one end of the series thought English, that is, emotions and feelings so grouped and arranged as to be communicable by an Englishman to an Englishman. The next stage is nerve English, which breaks up into several different dialects, as it were, according to the direction in which the nerve force moves on to the muscles, where something exists, which we had not previously noted, but which might be called muscle English. Next, we have movement English, and this likewise divides itself into several species. 
for the fingers may move as in writing or typewriting or in making the so-called deaf and dumb alphabet or the movement may be limited to the lungs and mouth we come now to vibration english and this again is of several kinds inasmuch as the vibration may be of the luminiferous ether or of air or of some solid as a wire the first results in sight english the others in sound english but at this point the englishes are converted into nerve english again to become in its turn thought english but nowhere in all these transfers do we find the abstract the ideal english so intricate is the language process when viewed even thus cursorily there are those who have studied each of these languages with as much detail as the present stage of our advancement allows exact measurements have taken the place of vague imaginings force pitch and duration have been analyzed by means of instruments of precision and there is already hope of general agreement on many points which are involved in the true theory of mere words End of Seven Processes of Language by Andrew Ingram The Seven Wise Men of Preston From Winter Evening Tales by Amelia Edith Huddleston Barr This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Let me introduce to our readers seven of the wisest men of the present century, the seven drafters and signers of the first teetotal pledge. The movement originated in the mind of Joseph Livesey and a short consideration of the circumstances and surroundings of his useful career will give us the best insight into the necessities and influences which gave it birth he was born near preston in lincolnshire in the year seventeen ninety five the beginning of an era in english history which scarcely has a parallel for national suffering the excitement of the french revolution still agitated all classes and commercial distress and political animosities made still more terrible the universal scarcity of food and the prostration of the manufacturing business his father and mother died early and he was left to the charge of his grandfather who unfortunately abandoned his farm and became a cotton spinner lancashire men had not then been wetted by daily attrition which seemed to their present keen and shrewd character and the elder livesey lost all he possessed the records of the cotton printing and spinning mention with honour the messrs livesey of preston as the first who put into practice bell's invention of cylindrical printing of calicoes in 1785 but whether the firms are identical or not i have no certain knowledge it shows however that they were a race inclined to improvements and ready to test an advance movement that joseph livesey's youth was a hard and bitter one there is no doubt the price of flour continued for years fabulously high so much so that wealthy people generally pledged themselves to reduce their use of it one-third and puddings or cakes were considered on any table a sinful extravagance when the government was offering large premiums to farmers for raising extra quantities and detailing soldiers to assist in threshing it poor bankrupt spinners must have had a hard struggle for a bare existence indeed education was hardly thought possible and though joseph managed by hook or crook to learn how to read write and count a little it was through difficulties and discouragements that would have been fatal to any ordinary intelligence or will 
Until he was twenty-one years of age, he worked patiently at his loom, which stood in one corner of a cellar, so cold and damp that its walls were constantly wet. But he was hopeful, and even in those dark days dared to fall in love. On attaining his majority, he received a legacy of thirty pounds. Then he married the poor girl who had made brighter its hard apprenticeship and lived happily with her for fifty years. But the troubles that had begun before his birth and which did not lighten until after the passing of the Reform Bill in June 1832 had then attained a proportion which taxed the utmost energies of both private charities and the national government. The year of Joseph Livesey's marriage saw the passage of the Corn Laws and the first of those famous mass meetings in Petersfield, near Manchester, which undoubtedly moulded the future temper and the status of the English weavers and spinners. From one of these meetings the following year, thousands of starving men started en masse to London. They were followed by the military and brought back for punishment or died miserably on the road, though five hundred of them reached Macclesfield and a smaller number Derby. But Livesey, though probably suffering as keenly as others, joined no body of rioters. He borrowed a sovereign and bought two cheeses. Then cutting them up into small lots, he retailed them on the streets, Saturday afternoons, when the men were released from work, the profit from this small investment exceeding what it was possible for him to make at his loom, he continued the trade, and from the small beginning founded a business and made a fortune which had enabled him to devote a long life to public usefulness and benevolence. But his little craft must have needed skillful piloting, for his family increased rapidly during the disastrous years between 1816 and 1832, so disastrous that in 1825-26 the Bank of England was obliged to authorize the Chamber of Commerce to make loans to individuals carrying on large works of from £500 to £10,000. Bankruptcies were enormous. Trade was everywhere stagnant. £60,000 were subscribed for meal and peas to feed the starving and the government issued 40,000 articles of clothing. The quarrels between masters and spinners were more and more bitter. Mills were everywhere burnt, and at Ashton, in one day, 30,000 hands turned out. During these dreadful years, every thoughtful person had noticed how much misery and ill-will was caused by the constant thronging to public houses. And temperance societies had been at work among the angry men of the working classes. Joseph Livesey had been actively engaged in this work, but these first efforts of the temperance cause were directed entirely against spirits. The use of wine and ale was considered then a necessity of life. Brewing was in most families as regular and important a duty as baking. The youngest children had their mug of ale, and clergymen were spoken of without reproach as one, two, or three bottle men. But Joseph Livesey soon became satisfied that these half measures were doing no good at all, and in 1831 a little circumstance decided him to take a stronger position. He had to go to Blackburn to see a person on business, and, as a matter of course, Whiskey was put on the table. Livesey for the first time tasted it, and was very ill in consequence. He had then a large family of boys, and both for their sakes and that of others, 
he resolved to halt no longer between two opinions he spoke at once in all the temperance meetings of the folly of partial reforms pointed out the hundreds of relapses and urged upon the association the duty of absolute abstinence his zeal warmed with his efforts and he insisted that in the matter of drinking the golden mean was the very sin for which the laodicean church had been cursed the disputes were very angry and bitter far more so than we at this day can believe possible unless we take into account the universal national habits and its poetic and domestic associations with every phase of english life but he gradually gained adherence to his views though it was not until the following year he was able to take another step forward it was on thursday august twenty third eighteen thirty two that the first solemn pledge of total abstinence was taken that afternoon joseph livesey pondering the matter in his mind saw john king pass his shop he asked him to come in and talk the subject over with him before they parted livesey asked king if he would join him in a pledge to abstain forever from all liquors and king said he would livesey then wrote out a form and laying it before king said the sign it first lad king signed it livesey followed him and the two men clasped hands and stood pledged to one of the greatest works humanity has ever undertaken a special meeting was then called and after a stormy debate the main part of the audience left a small number remaining to continue the argument but the end of it was that seven men came forward and drew up and signed the following document which is still preserved we agree to abstain from all liquors of an intoxicating quality whether they be ale porter wine or ardent spirits except as medicine john gratrex edward dickinson john broadbent john smith joseph livesey david enderton john king all these reformers were virtually working men though most of them rose to positions of respect and affluence still the humility of the origin of the movement was long a source of contempt and its members within my own recollection had the stigma of vulgarity almost in right of their convictions but god takes hands with good men's efforts and the cause prospered just where it was most needed among the operatives and the common people one of these latter a hawker of fish called richard turner stood in a very amusing and unexpected way sponsor for the society richard was fluent of speech and if his language was the broadest patois it was nevertheless of the most convincing character he always spoke well and if authorized words failed him readily coined what he needed one night while making a very fervent speech he said no halfway measures here nothing but the t t total will do mr livesey at once seized the word and rising proposed it as the name of the society the proposition was received with enthusiastic cheering and these root and branch temperance men were thenceforward known as teetotalers richard remained all his life a sturdy advocate of the cause and when he died in 1846 i made one of the hundreds and thousands that crowded the street of the beautiful town of preston and followed him to his grave the stone above it chronicles shortly his name and death and the fact that he was the author of a word known now wherever christianity and civilization are known end of the seven wise men of preston 
by Amelia Edith Huddleston Burr. Read by Ratandeep Satwan Singh, Jamshedpur, India. Liber 777 by Alistair Crowley. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The following is an attempt to systematize alike the data of mysticism and the results of comparative religion. The skeptic will applaud our labors, for that the very Catholicity of the symbols denies them any objective validity, since in so many contradictions something must be false. While the mystic will rejoice equally that the self-same Catholicity all-embracing proves that very validity, since after all something must be true. Fortunately, we have learnt to combine these ideas not in the mutual toleration of subcontraries, but in the affirmation of contraries, that transcending of the laws of intellect, which is madness in the ordinary man, genius in the overman, who hath arrived to strike off more fetters from our understanding, the savage who cannot conceive of the number six, the orthodox mathematician who cannot conceive of the fourth dimension, the philosopher who cannot conceive of the absolute, all these are one. All must be impregnated with the divine essence of the phallic yod of Macroprosopus and give birth to their idea. True, we may agree with Balzac, the absolute recedes. We never grasp it, but in the travelling there is joy. Am I no better than a Staphylococcus because my ideas still crowd in chains? but we digress. The last attempts to tabulate knowledge are the Kabbalah Denudata of Knorr von Rosenroth, a work incomplete and in some of its parts prostituted to the service of dogmatic interpretation. The lost symbolism of the vault in which Christian Rosenkreutz is said to have been buried, some of the work of Dr. D. and Sir Edward Kelly, some very imperfect tables in Cornelius Agrippa, the art of Raymond Lully, some of the very artificial effusions of the esoteric theosophists, and, of late years, the knowledge of the order Rosae Rubii et Aureae Crucis and the hermetic order of the Golden Dawn. Unluckily, the leading spirit in these latter societies found that his prayer give us this day our daily whisky and just a wee drappy mare for luck, was sternly answered, when you have given us this day our daily knowledge lecture. Under these circumstances Doth got mixed with Dewar and Beelzebub with Buchanan. But even the best of these systems is excessively bulky. Modern methods have enabled us to concentrate the substance of twenty thousand pages in two score. The best of the serious attempts to systematize the results of comparative religion is that made by Blavatsky, but though she had an immense genius for acquiring facts, she had none whatever for sorting and selecting the essentials. Grant Allen made a very slipshod experiment in this line, so have some of the polemical rationalists. But the only man worthy of our notice is Fraser of the Golden Bough. Here again there is no tabulation. For us it is left to sacrifice literary charm, and even some accuracy, in order to bring out the one great point. This, that when a Japanese thinks of Hashiman, and a boar of the Lord of Hosts, they are not two thoughts, but one. The cause of human sectarianism is not lack of sympathy in thought, but in speech, and this it is our not unambitious design to remedy. Every new sect aggravates the situation, especially the Americans, 
grossly and crapulously ignorant as they are of the rudiments of human language seize like mongrel curs upon the putrid bones of their decaying monkey jabber and gnaw and tear them with fierce growls and howls the mental prostitute mrs eddy for example having invented the idea which ordinary people call god christened it mind and then by affirming a set of propositions about mind which are only true of god set all hysterical dyspeptic crazy america by the ears personally i don't object to people discussing the properties of four-sided triangles but i draw the line when they use a well-known word such as pig or mental healer or dung heap to denote the object of their paranoiac fetishism even among serious philosophers the confusion is very great such terms as god the absolute spirit have dozens of connotations according to the time and place of the dispute and the beliefs of the disputants time enough that these definitions and their interrelation should be crystallized even at the expense of accepted philosophical accuracy the principal sources of our tables have been the philosophers and traditional systems referred to above as also among many others pietri di abano lily eliphaz levi sir r burton swami vivekananda the hindu buddhist and chinese classics the quran and its commentators the book of the dead and in particular original research the chinese hindu buddhist moslem and egyptian systems have never before been brought into line with the kabbalah the tarot has never been made public eliphaz levi knew the true attributions but was forbidden to use them all this secrecy is very silly an indicible arcanum is an arcanum that cannot be revealed it is simply bad faith to swear a man to the most horrible penalties if he betray etc and then take him mysteriously apart and confide the hebrew alphabet to his safe keeping this is perhaps only ridiculous but it is a wicked imposture to pretend to have received it from rosicrucian manuscripts which are to be found in the british museum to obtain money on these grounds as has been done by certain moderns is clear and i trust indictable fraud the secrets of adepts are not to be revealed to men we only wish they were when a man comes to me and asks for the truth i go away and practice teaching the differential calculus to a bushman and i answer the former only when i have succeeded with the latter but to withhold the alphabet of mysticism from the learner is the device of a selfish charlatan that which can be taught shall be taught and that which cannot be taught may at last be learnt as a weary but victorious warrior delights to recall his battles fortisan haec olim meminisse juvabit we would linger for a moment upon the difficulties of our task the question of sacred alphabets has been abandoned as hopeless as one who should probe the nature of woman the deeper he goes the rottener it gets so that at last it is seen that there is no sound bottom all is arbitrary withdrawing out caustics and adopting a protective treatment we point to the beautiful clean bandages and ask the clinic to admire to take one concrete example the english t is clearly equivalent in sound to the hebrew tav the greek tau the arabic te and the coptic te but the numeration is not the same again we have a clear analogy in shape perhaps a whole series of analogies 
which on comparing the modern alphabets with primeval examples breaks up and is indecipherable the same difficulty in another form permeates the question of gods priests to propitiate their local fetish would flatter him with the title of creator philosophers with a wider outlook would draw identities between many gods in order to obtain a unity time and the gregarious nature of man have raised gods as ideas grew more universal sectarianism has drawn false distinctions between identical gods for polemical purposes thus where shall we put isis favoring nymph of corn as she was as the type of motherhood as the moon as the great goddess earth as nature as the cosmic egg from which all nature sprang for as time and place have changed so she is all of these what of jehovah that testy senior of genesis that lawgiver of leviticus that phallus of the depopulated slaves of the egyptians that jealous king god of the times of the kings that more spiritual conception of the captivity only invented when all temporal hope was lost that medieval battleground of cross-chopped logic that being stripped of all his attributes and assimilated to para brahman and the absolute of the philosopher satan again who in job is merely attorney-general and prosecutes for the crown acquires in time all the obloquy attaching to that functionary in the eyes of the criminal classes and becomes a slanderer does any one really think that any angel is such a fool as to try to gull the omniscient god into injustice to his saints then on the other hand what of moloch that form of jehovah denounced by those who did not draw huge profit from his rights what of the savage and morose jesus of the evangelicals cut by their petty malice from the gentle jesus of the italian children how shall we identify the thaumaturgic chauvinist of matthew with the metaphysical logos of john in short while the human mind is mobile so long will the definitions of all our terms vary but it is necessary to settle on something bad rules are better than no rules at all we may then hope that our critics will aid our acknowledged feebleness and if it be agreed that much learning hath made us mad that we may receive humane treatment and a liberal allowance of rubber cores in our old age the tree of life is the skeleton on which this body of truth is built the juxtaposition and proportion of its parts should be fully studied practice alone will enable the student to determine how far an analogy may be followed out again some analogies may escape a superficial study the beetle is only connected with the sign pisces through the tarot trump the moon the camel is only connected with the high priestess through the letter gimel since all things whatsoever including no thing may be placed upon the tree of life the table could never be complete it is already somewhat unwieldy we have tried to confine ourselves as far as possible to lists of things generally unknown it must be remembered that the lesser tables are only divided from the thirty-two fold table in order to economize space e g in the sevenfold table the entries under saturn belong to the thirty-second part in the large table we have been unable for the moment to tabulate many great systems of magic the four lesser books of the lamegaton the system of abramelin if indeed its cliffothic ramifications are susceptible of classification once we follow it below the great and terrible demonic triads which are under the presidency of the unutterable name the vast and comprehensive system shadowed in the book called the book of the concourse of the forces 
interwoven as it is with the tarot being indeed on one view little more than an amplification and practical application of the book of thoth but we hope that the present venture will attract scholars from all quarters as when the wounded satan leaned upon his spear forthwith on all sides to his aid was run by angels many and strong and that in the course of time a far more satisfactory volume may result many columns will seem to the majority of people to consist of mere lists of senseless words practice and advance in the magical or mystical path will enable little by little to interpret more and more even as a flower unfolds beneath the ardent kisses of the sun so will this table reveal its glories to the dazzling eye of illumination symbolic and barren as it is yet it shall stand for the athletic student as a perfect sacrament so that reverently closing its pages he shall exclaim may that of which we have partaken sustain us in the search for the quintessence the stone of the wise the summum bonus true wisdom and perfect happiness so mote it be end of liber seven 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 by alistair crowley read by cynthia moyer all the world's a stage from as you like it by william shakespeare read by tony rao this is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players they have their exits and entrances and one man in his time plays many parts his acts being seven ages at first the infant mewling and puking in the nurse's arms then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like snail unwillingly to school and then the lover sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow then a soldier, full of strange oaths, and bearded like the pard, jealous in honour, sudden, and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice in fair round belly, with good capon lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved a world too wide, for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice, turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion, Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. End of the Seven Ages of Man by William Shakespeare. Seven Little Maids or The Birthday Week by Mary A. Lathbury. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE BIRTHDAY WEEK Monday's bairn is fair a face, Tuesday's bairn is full a grace, Wednesday's bairn's a child of woe, Thursday's bairn has far to go, Friday's bairn is lovin' and given, Saturday's bairn must work for a livin', but the child that's born on the Sabbath day is wise and bonny and good and gay. Monday, fair of face. O little maid of many moods, the dimples in thy face flit in and out like tricksy elves with soft and sudden grace. 
and when i search thy face the smiles and blushes come and go like little drifts of gold and rose across the sunset snow some day the mirror or thy friends will tell thee thou art fair and fairy folk will fill thy head with dreams as light as air some day but ah believe them not who praise thy pretty face but trim the little lamp within that gives the outward grace tuesday full of grace upon thy birth morn little maid the swallow's airy flight led past thy window to the wood where fairies danced at night and since thy little feet began to patter to and fro the rhythm of the fairy ring is felt where'er they go what is the secret of the grace that runs like songs of birds or like their flight in air through all thy merry ways and words i fear me thou hast unseen wings that may alas the day unfold some sunny easter morn and carry thee away wednesday a child of woe blue eyes true eyes but full of tears some shadow o'er thy tender years like rain clouds on a morn in may shuts out the sunshine of the day perhaps some dear accustomed face has strangely faded from its place on earth but leaning from the skies has won thy wistful dreamy eyes but the clear shining after rain will turn the gray to gold again and love grown rich with long delay will come in other guise some day some day some day when ships come in and those who lost at last shall win then blue eyes true eyes wet with rain the sun shall fill thy skies again thursday far to go i know a little wilful maid who swings her hammock in the shade and swinging sings a roundelay as wild as a bird's and all the words are over the hills and far away sometimes among the sea rocks gray she counts the passing sails all day and sings or sighs which can it be a little refrain again and again my heart my heart is over the sea how shall we charm the restless mood is there a drop of gypsy blood in those blue veins ah we must wait for woe and weal are under a seal fast folded in the book of fate friday loving and giving little loving giving maiden frighted waited overladen with the love that finds in giving all the joy and end of living when she has no gift for blessing only love she sighs caressing ah she knows not all her treasure love is more than gifts can measure can it be that days are coming when some princely beggar roaming on a quest of love and daring all her sweetness will be wearing for a day to deck his armor lest some loveless love should charm her angels call her love her woo her open heaven's gates unto her saturday a little housemaid why is your work song over honey bee mine i call there's surely a cloud on the clover i fear me rain may fall oh the workaday world is spinning for ever a dull brown thread with never a fair beginning and never an end she said oh blind little spinner believing is sight for the eyes that see the lord of thy life is weaving a wonderful web for thee his hands have wrought ever beside thee the work of thy days they hold and the dull brown threads that tried thee are turning to white and gold sunday wise and bonny and good and gay do you ask me of my matey is she wise like the flowers the bees the birds she has wisdom without words she is like a rose unfolding love and life and death beholding with a slowly waking wonder in her eyes is she good and gay and bonny like the air breathes she goodness sweetness truth with her simple guileless youth like a lily or a morning she is gay in her adorning 
and to all who know and love her she is fair end of seven little maids or the birthday week by mary a lathbury the seven ravens by jacob and wilhelm grimm this is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org there was once a man who had seven sons and last of all one daughter although the little girl was very pretty she was so weak and small that they thought she could not live but they said she should at once be christened so the father sent one of his sons in haste to the spring to get some water but the other six ran with him each wanted to be first at drawing the water and so they were in such a hurry that all let their pitchers fall into the well and they stood very foolishly looking at one another and did not know what to do for none dared go home in the meantime the father was uneasy and could not tell what made the young men stay so long surely said he the whole seven must have forgotten themselves over some game of play and when he had waited still longer and they yet did not come he flew into a rage and wished them all turned into ravens scarcely had he spoken these words when he heard a croaking over his head and looked up and saw seven ravens as black as coal flying round and round sorry as he was to see his wish so fulfilled he did not know how what was done could be undone and comforted himself as well as he could for the loss of his seven sons with his dear little daughter who soon became stronger and every day more beautiful for a long time she did not know that she had ever had any brothers, for her father and mother took care not to speak of them before her. But one day, by chance, she heard the people about her speak of them. Yes, said they, she is beautiful indeed, but still tis a pity that her brothers should have been lost for her sake. Then she was much grieved, and went to her father and mother, and asked if she had any brothers, and what had become of them. So they dared no longer hide the truth from her, but said it was the will of heaven, and that her birth was only the innocent cause of it. But the little girl mourned sadly about it every day, and thought herself bound to do all she could to bring her brothers back, and she had neither rest nor ease, till at length one day she stole away, and set out into the wide world to find her brothers, wherever they might be, and free them whatever it might cost her she took nothing with her but a little ring which her father and mother had given her a loaf of bread in case she should be hungry a little pitcher of water in case she should be thirsty and a little stool to rest upon when she should be weary thus she went on and on and journeyed till she came to the world's end then she came to the sun but the sun looked much too hot and fiery so she ran away quickly to the moon but the moon was cold and chilly and said i smell flesh and blood this way so she took herself away in a hurry and came to the stars and the stars were friendly and kind to her and each star sat upon his own little stool but the morning star rose up and gave her a little piece of wood and said if you have not this little piece of wood you cannot unlock the castle that stands on the glass mountain and there your brothers live the little girl took the piece of wood rolled it up in a little cloth and went on again until she came to the glass mountain and found the door shut then she felt for the little piece of wood but when she unwrapped the cloth it was not there and she saw she had lost the gift of the good stars what was to be done she wanted to save her brothers and had no key of the castle of the glass mountain so this faithful little sister took a knife out of her pocket and cut off her little finger that was just the size of the piece of wood she had lost and put it in the door and opened it as she went in a little dwarf came up to her and said what are you seeking for i seek my brothers the seven ravens answered she then the dwarf said 
My masters are not at home, but if you will wait till they come, pray step in. Now the little dwarf was getting their dinner ready, and he brought their food upon seven little plates, and their drink in seven little glasses, and set them upon the table, and out of each little plate their sister ate a small piece, and out of each little glass she drank a small drop, but she let the ring that she had brought with her fall into the last glass. On a sudden she heard a fluttering and croaking in the air, and the dwarf said, "'Here come my masters.' When they came in they wanted to eat and drink, and looked for their little plates and glasses, then said one after the other, "'Who has eaten from my little plate, and who has been drinking out of my little glass? Caw, caw, well I ween, mortal lips have this way been.' When the seventh came to the bottom of his glass and found there the ring, he looked at it, and knew that it was his father's and mother's, and said, "'Oh, that our little sister would but come! Then we should be free!' When the little girl heard this, for she stood behind the door all the time and listened, she ran forward, and in an instant all the ravens took their right form again, and all hugged and kissed each other, and went merrily home." End of the Seven Ravens by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm Recording by Amy Graymore Chapter One of the Seven Cardinal Virtues by James Stalker This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One Wisdom The Seven Deadly Sins formed the theme of a former volume of this series, and it seems natural to follow up that course with another on The Seven Cardinal Virtues. The idea of The Seven Deadly Sins is that among the innumerable sins of which human beings may be guilty there are seven of peculiar virulence from which all the rest can be derived and in the same way the idea of the seven cardinal virtues is that among the countless excellences with which human character may be adorned there are seven which overtop the rest and from which all the rest are derivable. The adjective cardinal refers especially to this latter point. It signifies that these are the virtues on which all others hinge. For instance, in the one with which this first chapter will be occupied, wisdom, six virtues are included according to one ancient authority and no fewer than ten according to another the idea of cardinal virtues is an exceedingly old one it occurs in plato and aristotle and from these famous philosophers it descended to the greek philosophical schools from the greeks it passed to the romans being prominent in the writings of cicero and from them it passed to the fathers of the church. The Greeks, however, only counted four cardinal virtues, wisdom, courage, temperance, and justice. According to them, these were the four sides of a perfectly symmetrical character, and the man who possessed them could stand four square to all the winds that blow. In the Old Testament Apocrypha these four are also mentioned, and a Jewish writer of the time of our Lord, Philo of Alexandria, compares them to the four rivers that watered the Garden of Eden, so do these fertilize and adorn human nature. Christianity, however, introduced a nomenclature as well as a conception of virtue of its own many virtues are mentioned in the new testament but there are three which occur constantly as comprehending in themselves the whole of christian character namely faith hope and charity 
when the fathers of the church began to build their systems of dogma of course they selected the stones out of the quarry of the bible but they were also powerfully under the influence of greek philosophy especially of aristotle and in constructing an ethical system what they did was to take the triad of virtues from the new testament and add to it the quartet derived from philosophy and thus there emerged the heptad which we are to discuss in the following pages perhaps in thus combining things having diverse origins they did not sufficiently consider whether the old virtues were not to some extent identical with the new but for practical purposes no great harm is done if a bit of the ground here and there is gone over twice and it is of distinct advantage to be reminded that christian character has a natural foundation though of course even the heathen virtues are modified when they appear in the mosaic of christian character sometimes the name of cardinal virtues is restricted to the four virtues of the pre-christian philosophers whereas the other three are named the christian or the theological virtues but certainly the latter are cardinal also that is hinge virtues and it is convenient to have a single adjective for designating the whole seven we begin our study of the seven virtues by treating of wisdom and i shall show that it is first a vision of the ideal secondly the finding of the way and thirdly a lesson to be learnt one a vision of the ideal wisdom is the foremost of the virtues it is the lamp-bearer showing the way to the rest its principal business is to descry the goal to which they should all strive and the point to which the whole course of life should tend when thomas carlyle was an old man he said to some one that he was often pondering the first question of the shorter catechism what is the chief end of man with its wonderful answer man's chief end is to glorify god and to enjoy him for ever every scotsman has known this question and answer ever since he can remember but few may have reflected on the reason why this should be the first question it is the first because it is taken for granted that the foremost inquiry of a rational being will be about the purpose of its own existence in reality this is often the last question rather than the first still it is a sublime fact that the first seed of thought dropped into the mind of a whole nation should be a question like this which tends to make those to whom it is addressed ponder on the purpose of life why have i been born why am i alive why should i wish to go on living these are the thoughts suggested to the mind by this first question of the catechism and it is in thoughts like these that wisdom has its birth that which in the old language of the catechism is called the chief end is exactly the same as in modern language we call the ideal and every modern mind can appreciate the importance of the question what is man's ideal for no belief has more complete possession of the modern mind than the necessity of ideals and the maxim is common that if you wish to find out a man's moral worth you have to find out what his ideal is perhaps it might be said of many men that they have no ideal and this is their condemnation they have no object in life they have never reflected why they are alive their course is determined not by their own choice but by the blind forces of appetite within and of conventionality without such may truly be said to be dead whilst they live for surely in such a vast and perilous enterprise as the voyage of life the first duty of every one who claims to be a man 
is to be aware where he is going but from another point of view it may be said that every human being has his own ideal whether he is aware of it or not in every mind consciously or unconsciously there forms itself by degrees some supreme desire to which the thoughts are ever tending and towards the attainment of which the endeavours are ever set it may be pleasure or success or some special form of one or other of these the drunkard is not aware of the hold his vice has on him but drink is the object to which his reveries and designs are ever bent the miser does not know himself to be the slave of money but it absorbs his thoughts by day and his dreams by night the woman of the world would not confess to herself that social advancement is her idol but year by year the passion for it burns in her blood and determines her conduct in this sense ideals are innumerable and it is by their crossing and clashing their vehemence and urgency that the myriad coloured spectacle of existence is produced but they are for the most part unconscious or at least unavowed the ideal of the first answer of the shorter catechism is a very high one to glorify god and to enjoy him for ever but if we are to have a conscious and avowed ideal how can we pitch it lower can we be satisfied without having the approval of god in this life and the prospect of spending our eternity with him in the life to come you may alter the name of the ideal many in our day would prefer christ's own name for it the kingdom of god others might call it welfare or blessedness or perfection but the name signifies little the essential thing is that we should know and avow what we intend to be and to do in this world and in which port we intend to arrive when the voyage is finished this is wisdom two the finding of the way wisdom is concerned not only with the goal but the way to it not only with the end but the means for attaining it not only with the ideal but the actual a pilot guiding a ship up a river in the dark sees afar off the shining light which marks his destination but if he is to arrive there he has to mark a hundred lesser lights by which his course from point to point is indicated and if he neglected these his ship would be aground long before he was halfway up the channel so suppose a man has chosen the goal indicated in the answer to the first question of the shorter catechism as his own this supreme purpose includes many subordinate purposes such as the development of his character the discharge of his duty as a citizen of his duty as a member of the church of his duty in the family his success in business and so on in fact as the pilot has to be watchful at every bend of the course at every encounter with a passing ship and at every change in the state of the tide so has the wise man to choose his path every day and every hour he has to compare and to weigh and to judge he has to appropriate the good and reject the bad he has to discern what will help and what will hinder and he has to pitch upon the means that will take him not only to the ultimate end but to the several halting places by the way the latin name for the virtue which the greeks called wisdom is prudence and this change is characteristic in the process of passing from the one ancient language to the other ideas frequently lost something of their loftiness 
and delicacy the romans were a practical people and they aimed low taking for granted that the end of life consisted in getting on they restricted the task of wisdom to the means of attaining it such a debased wisdom has never died out of the world and bunyan has embodied its characteristics in mr worldly wise man yet there is a prudence which is not ignoble but an essential part of wisdom if we would reach the end even the highest end we must use the means we must know the facts of the world facts are stubborn things and we may make them either our friends or our foes as fire may either be a devouring element or the force that carries us and our burdens at the rate of sixty miles an hour and as electricity may either be death-dealing lightning or the mercury to carry our messages round the globe we may set nature up against us or we may convert it into a friend and helper and wisdom consists in doing the latter still more it is displayed in dealing with human nature we have to realize the purpose of our life not in a vacuum or a solitude but in a world of men and women and every one of those we encounter may either further our aim or retard it every human heart is a mystery and human nature is a great deep in nothing is wisdom more displayed than in knowing men and women and in so treating them that they may favor our advance instead of opposing it in one word we must know and obey the laws on all objects and on all events the laws are written in hieroglyphics which the wise man can decipher but the fool misreads or does not see at all not only are there a narrow road and a broad road to be chosen once for all but at every step there are a right and a wrong and a choice has to be made conscience within and god above whisper this is the way walk ye in it and blessed is he who thereupon walks straight forward even though at the moment it seems to be into the jaws of hell but if when reason and conscience and god are saying this way a man believes he is going to happiness by walking in the opposite direction that man is a fool three a lesson to be learnt it was a question discussed of old in the philosophical schools of greece whether wisdom can be taught there is more of an intellectual element in it than in the other virtues and wisdom has sometimes been so conceived as to make it the peculiar property of men of talent or genius nor can it be denied that some natures are from birth more akin to it than others who would deny plato's gift of intuition into the laws of the moral universe or shakespeare's instinctive discernment of human nature but if wisdom consist in the choice of the true end of life and in the use of those means for attaining it placed by providence at our disposal then must it be the privilege and the duty of every child of adam for not one is intended or doomed beforehand to miss the end and therefore it must be capable of being acquired how then is wisdom to be obtained partly by precept there have been many wise men in the world before us and vast stores of wisdom have been accumulated these are to be found partly in the tradition that comes down to us by means of speech as for instance in the proverbs which fly from mouth to mouth and descend from parent to child these maxims hewn from life 
are the concentrated essence of a nation's wisdom and there is no nation which does not possess proverbs of its own our own nation is specially rich in them and it is one mark of a wise man to annex these spontaneously and to speak in proverbs then the stores of the world's wisdom have been largely garnered in books and although a fool may read hundreds of these without becoming wise any one with the germs of wisdom in him will grow wiser by means of books if he chooses them well a book like bacon's essays shows how much wisdom can be packed into a hundred pages and sometimes a poet like burns in his letter to a young friend can distill the essence of the wisdom of an entire people into a few lines in the apocrypha there is a book entitled the book of wisdom and the name is not undeserved but it might be more justly applied to such a book as proverbs or to the bible as a whole several books of the old testament are spoken of sometimes as the wisdom literature because they frequently deal by name with this subject they are poetical books but the prophetical books are in a still higher sense a wisdom literature and even these pale before the oracles of our lord and his apostles in the new testament any one who aims at wisdom should take as his motto the verse in the first chapter of joshua only applying it to the whole bible this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then shalt thou make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success secondly wisdom is learned by practice it is as i have said partly an intellectual virtue but it consists much less in knowing than in doing it is slowly accumulated by experience and like the pearl which forms where the bivalve has been wounded it frequently springs from pain and misfortune other virtues shine most attractively in youth but wisdom is the special ornament of old age and it compensates for the drawbacks of this period of life best of all is wisdom to be learned through imitation he that walketh with wise men shall be wise says the book of proverbs but a companion of fools shall smart for it it is not indeed so easy as such advices might imply to get into the company of the wise they have their own friends and companions and may be jealous of intrusion on their privacy and on their time a wise man might be making himself a companion of fools if he kept company with us, and we must be prepared to pass through the ordeal of a searching inspection. But there is at least one who will not cast us out, and his friendship is more certain to make us wise than that of any other. One of the names of the Saviour is Wisdom, and he it is said in holy scripture is made of god unto us wisdom he places no bounds to the intimacy we may seek with him and if we are thus made wise unto salvation there is little fear but we shall be welcome to other wise companionship even in this world while in the world to come we may reckon on a humble place in that society of which it has been written they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever end of chapter one of the seven cardinal virtues by james stalker
read by Cynthia Moyer. The Seventh Pullet by Saki. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It's not the daily grind that I complain of, said Blinkenthrope resentfully. It's the dull grey sameness of my life outside of office hours. Nothing of interest comes my way, nothing remarkable or out of the common. Even the little things that I do try to find some interest in don't seem to interest other people. Things in my garden, for instance. The potato that weighed just over two pounds, said his friend Goreworth. Did I tell you about that? said Blinkenthrope. I was telling the others in the train this morning. I forgot if I'd told you. To be exact, you told me that it weighed just under two pounds. But I took into account the fact that abnormal vegetables and freshwater fish have an afterlife in which growth is not arrested. You're just like the others, said Blinkenthrope sadly. You only make fun of it. The fault is with the potato, not with us, said Goreworth. We are not in the least interested in it, because it is not in the least interesting. The men you go up in the train with every day are just in the same case as yourself. Their lives are commonplace and not very interesting to themselves, and they certainly are not going to wax enthusiastic over the commonplace events in other men's lives. Tell them something startling, dramatic, piquant, that has happened to yourself or to someone in your family, and you will capture their interest at once. They will talk about you with a certain personal pride to all their acquaintances. Man, I know intimately, fellow called Blenkinthrope, lives down my way, had two of his fingers clawed clean off by a lobster he was carrying home to supper. Doctor says entire hand may have to come off. Now that is conversation of a very high order. But imagine walking into a tennis club with the remark, I know a man who has grown a potato weighing two and a quarter pounds. But hang it all, my dear fellow, said Blenkinthrope impatiently, haven't I just told you that nothing of a remarkable nature ever happens to me? Invent something, said Goreworth. Since winning a prize for excellence in scriptural knowledge at a preparatory school, he had felt licensed to be a little more unscrupulous than the circle he moved in. Much might surely be excused to one who in early life could give a list of seventeen trees mentioned in the Old Testament. What sort of thing? asked Blinkenthrope, somewhat snappishly. A snake got into your hen-run yesterday morning and killed six out of seven pullets, first mesmerizing them with its eyes and then biting them as they stood helpless. The seventh pullet was one of that French sort, with feathers all over its eyes, so it escaped the mesmeric snare and just flew at what it could see of the snake and pecked it to pieces. Thank you, said Blinkenthrope stiffly. It's a very clever invention. If such a thing had really happened in my poultry run, I admit I should have been proud and interested to tell people about it. But I'd rather stick to fact, even if it's plain fact. All the same his mind dwelt wistfully on the story of the seventh pullet. He could picture himself telling it in the train amid the absorbed interest of his fellow passengers. Unconsciously all sorts of little details and improvements began to suggest themselves. Wistfulness was still his dominant mood when he took his seat in the railway carriage the next morning. Opposite him sat Stephen Ham, who had attained to a recognized brevet of importance through the fact of an uncle having dropped dead in the act of voting at a parliamentary election. That had happened three years ago, but Stephen Ham was still deferred to on all questions of home and foreign politics. "'Hello, how's the giant mushroom, or whatever it was?' was all the notice Blenkinthrope got from his fellow travellers. Young Duckby, whom he mildly disliked, speedily monopolized the general attraction by an account of a domestic bereavement. Had four pigeons carried off last night by a whacking big rat. Oh, a monster he must have been. You could tell by the size of the hole he made breaking into the loft. No moderate-sized rat ever seemed to carry out any predatory operations in these regions, they were all enormous in their enormity. "'Pretty hard lines, that,' 
seeing that he had secured the attention and respect of the company. Four squeakers carried off at one swoop. You'd find it rather hard to match that in the way of unlooked-for bad luck. I had six pullets out of a pen of seven killed by a snake yesterday afternoon, said Blenkinthrope in a voice which he hardly recognized as his own. By a snake? came in excited chorus. It fascinated them with its deadly glittering eyes, one after the other, and struck them down while they stood helpless. A bedridden neighbor who wasn't able to call for assistance witnessed it all from her bedroom window. Well, I never broke in the chorus with variations. The interesting part of it is about the seventh pullet, the one that didn't get killed, resumed Blenkinthrope, slowly lighting a cigarette. His diffidence had left him, and he was beginning to realize how safe and easy depravity can seem once one has the courage to begin. The six dead birds were minorcas. The seventh was a hoodin with a mop of feathers all over its eyes. It could hardly see the snake at all, so, of course, it wasn't mesmerized like the others. It just could see something wriggling on the ground and went for it and pecked it to death. Well, I'm blessed! exclaimed the chorus. In the course of the next few days, Blenkinthrope discovered how little the loss of one's self-respect affects one when one has gained the esteem of the world. His story found its way into one of the poultry papers, and was copied thence into a daily news-sheet as a matter of general interest. A lady wrote from the north of Scotland, recounting a similar episode which she had witnessed as occurring between a stoat and a blind grouse. Somehow a lie seems so much less reprehensible when one can call it a lee. For a while the adapter of the seventh pullet story enjoyed to the full his altered standing as a person of consequence, one who had had some share in the strange events of his time. Then he was thrust once again into the cold grey background by the sudden blossoming into importance of Smith Padden, a daily fellow traveller whose little girl had been knocked down and nearly hurt by a car belonging to a musical comedy actress. The actress was not in the car at the time, but she was in numerous photographs which appeared in the illustrated papers of Zoto Dobreen, inquiring after the well-being of Maisie, daughter of Edmund Smith Padden, Esquire. With this new human interest to absorb them, the travelling companions were almost rude when Blenkinthrope tried to explain his contrivance for keeping vipers and peregrine falcons out of his chicken run. Goreworth, to whom he unburdened himself in private, gave him the same counsel as heretofore. Invent something. Yes, but what? The ready affirmative, coupled with the question, betrayed a significant shifting of the ethical standpoint. It was a few days later that Blenkinthrope revealed a chapter of family history to the customary gathering in the railway carriage. "'Curious thing happened to my aunt, the one who lives in Paris,' he began. He had several aunts, but they were all geographically distributed over Greater London. She was sitting on a seat in the Bois the other afternoon after lunching at the Romanian legation. Whatever the story gained in picturesqueness from the dragging in of diplomatic atmosphere— it ceased from that moment to command any acceptance as a record of current events. Goreworth had warned his neophyte that this would be the case, but the traditional enthusiasm of the neophyte had triumphed over discretion. She was feeling rather drowsy, the effect probably of the champagne, which she's not in the habit of taking in the middle of the day. A subdued murmur of admiration went round the company. Blinkenthrope's aunts were not used to taking champagne in the middle of the year, "'regarding it exclusively as a Christmas and New Year accessory. "'Presently a rather portly gentleman passed by her seat "'and paused an instant to light a cigar. "'At that moment a youngish man came up behind him, "'drew the blade from a sword-stick, "'and stabbed him half a dozen times through and through. "'Scoundrel!' he cried to his victim. "'You do not know me. My name is Henri Leterque.' The elder man wiped away some of the blood that was splattering his clothes, turned to his assailant, and said, "'And since when has an attempted assassination been considered an introduction?' Then he finished lighting his cigar and walked away. My aunt had intended screaming for the police, but seeing the indifference with which the principal in the affair treated the matter, she felt that it would be an impertinence on her part to interfere. 
Of course, I need hardly say she put the whole thing down to the effects of a warm, drowsy afternoon and the legation champagne. Now comes the astonishing part of my story. A fortnight later, a bank manager was stabbed to death with a sword-stick in that very part of the bois. His assassin was the son of a charwoman formerly working at the bank, who had been dismissed from her job by the manager on account of chronic intemperance. His name was Henri Le Turc. From that moment, Blenkinthrope was tacitly accepted as the Munchausen of the party. No effort was spared to draw him out from day to day in the exercise of testing their powers of credulity, and Blenkinthrope, in the false security of an assured and receptive audience, waxed industrious and ingenious in supplying the demand for marvels. Duckby's satirical story of a tame otter that had a tank in the garden to swim in, and whined restlessly whenever the water rate was overdue, was scarcely an unfair parody of some of Blenkinthrope's wilder efforts. And then one day came Nemesis. Returning to his villa one evening, Blenkinthrope found his wife sitting in front of a pack of cards, which she was scrutinizing with unusual concentration. "'The same old patience game?' he asked carelessly. "'No, dear, this is the death-head's patience, the most difficult of them all. I've never got it to work out, and somehow I should be rather frightened if I did. Mother only got it out once in her life. She was afraid of it, too. Her great-aunt had done it once and fallen dead from excitement the next moment. And Mother always had a feeling that she would die if she ever got it out.' She died the same night that she did it. She was in bad health at the time. Certainly. But it was a strange coincidence. Don't do it if it frightens you, was Blenkinthrope's practical comment as he left the room. A few minutes later his wife called to him. John, it gave me such a turn. I nearly got it out. Only the five of diamonds held me up at the end. I really thought I'd done it. Well, you can do it said Blenkinthrope, who had come back to the room. If you shift the eight of clubs onto that open nine, the five can be moved onto the six. His wife made the suggested move, with hasty, trembling fingers, and piled the outstanding cards onto their respective packs. Then she followed the example of her mother and great-grand-aunt. Blenkinthrope had been genuinely fond of his wife, but in the midst of his bereavement, one dominant thought obtruded itself. Something sensational and real had at last come into his life. No longer was it a grey, colourless record. The headlines, which might appropriately describe his domestic tragedy, kept shaping themselves in his brain. Inherited presentiment comes true. The death's head patience, card game that justified its sinister name in three generations. He wrote out a full story of the fatal occurrence for the Essex Vidette, the editor of which was a friend of his, and to another friend he gave a condensed account to be taken up to the office of one of the halfpenny dailies. But in both cases his reputation as a romancer stood fatally in the way of his fulfillment of his ambitions. Not the right thing to be munchausening in a time of sorrow, agreed his friends among themselves, and a brief note of regret at the sudden death of the wife of our respected neighbour, Mr. John Blenkinthrope, from heart failure, appearing in the news columns of the local paper, was the forlorn outcome of his visions of widespread publicity. Blenkinthrope shrank from the society of his erstwhile travelling companions, and took to travelling townwards by an earlier train. He sometimes tries to attract the sympathy and attention of a chance acquaintance, in details of the whistling prowess of his best canary, or the dimensions of his largest beetroot, he scarcely recognizes himself as the man who was once spoken about and pointed out as the owner of the seventh pullet. End of the seventh pullet by Saki, recording by Amy Graymore. The Woman at Seven Brothers, by Wilbur Daniel Steele. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karina Schultz. I tell you, sir, I was innocent. I didn't know any more about the world at twenty-two than some do at twelve. My uncle and aunt in Duxbury brought me up strict. I studied hard in high school. I worked hard after hours, and I went to church twice on Sundays. And I can't see it's right to put me in a place like this, with crazy people. Oh, yes, I know they're crazy. You can't tell me. As for what they said in court about finding her with her husband, that's the inspector's lie, sir, because he's down on me and wants to make it look like my fault. No, sir, I can't say as I thought she was handsome, not at first. For one thing, her lips were too thin and white, and her color was bad. I'll tell you a fact, sir. That first day I came off to the light, I was sitting on my cot in the storeroom, and that's where the assistant keeper sleeps at the Seven Brothers, as lonesome as I could be, away from home for the first time, and the water all around me, and, even though it was a calm day, pounding enough on the ledge to send a kind of whoom, 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 whining up through all that solid rock of the tower, and when old Fetterson poked his head down from the living room, with the sunshine above making a kind of bright frame around his hair and whiskers, to give me a cheery, "'Make yourself to home, son,' I remember I said to myself, "'He's all right. I'll get along with him. But his wife's enough to sour milk.' That was queer, because she was so much under him in age, along about twenty-eight or so, and him nearer fifty. But that's what I said, sir.' Of course, that feeling wore off, same as any feeling will wear off sooner or later in a place like the Seven Brothers. Cooped up in a place like that, you come to know folks so well that you forget what they do look like. There was a long time I never noticed her, any more than you'd noticed the cat. We used to sit of an evening around the table, as if you were Fetterson there and me here, and her somewhere back there in the rocker, knitting— Fetterson would be working on his Jacob's Ladder, and I'd be reading. He'd been working on that Jacob's Ladder a year, I guess, and every time the inspector came off with the tender, he was so astonished to see how good that ladder was that the old man would go to work and make it better. That's all he lived for. If I was reading, as I say, I daren't take my eyes off the book, or Fetterson had me, and then he'd begin what the inspector said about him, how surprised the member of the board had been that time to see everything so clean about the light, what the inspector had said about Fetterson's being stuck here in a second-class light, best keeper on the coast, and so on and so on, till either he or I had to go aloft and have a look at the wicks. He'd been there twenty-three years, all told, and he'd got used to the feeling that he was kept down unfair, so used to it, I guess, that he fed on it, and told himself how folks ashore would talk when he was dead and gone, best keeper on the coast, kept down unfair. Not that he said that to me. No, he was far too loyal and humble and respectful, doing his duty without complaint, as anybody could see. And all that time, night after night, hardly ever a word out of the woman— as I remember it, she seemed more like a piece of furniture than anything else, not even a very good cook, nor over and above tidy. One day, when he and I were trimming the lamp, he passed the remark that his first wife used to dust the lens and take a pride in it. Not that he said a word against Anna, though. He never said a word against any living mortal. He was too upright. I don't know how it came about— or, rather, I do know, but it was so sudden and so far away from my thoughts that it shocked me, like the world turned over. It was at prayers. That night, I remember Fetterson was uncommon long-winded. We'd had a batch of newspapers out by the tender, and at such times the old man always made a long watch of it, getting the world straightened out. For one thing, the United States minister to Turkey was dead— well, from him and his soul, Fetterson got on to Turkey and the Presbyterian College there, and from that to heathen in general. He rambled on and on, like the surf on the ledge, whoom, 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 never coming to an end. You know how you'll be at prayer sometimes? My mind strayed. I counted the canes in the chair seat where I was kneeling. I plaited a corner of the tablecloth between my fingers for a spell— 
and by and by my eyes went wandering up the back of the chair. The woman, sir, was looking at me. Her chair was back to mine, close, and both our heads were down in the shadow under the edge of the table, with Bedderson clear over on the other side by the stove. And there were her two eyes hunting mine between the spindles in the shadow. You won't believe me, sir, but I tell you, I felt like jumping to my feet and running out of the room. It was so queer. I don't know what her husband was praying about after that. His voice didn't mean anything, no more than the seas on the ledge away down there. I went to work to count the canes in the seat again, but all my eyes were in the top of my head. It got so I couldn't stand it. We were at the Lord's Prayer, saying it sing-song together, when I had to look up again. And there her two eyes were, between the spindles, hunting mine. Just then all of us were saying, Forgive us our trespasses. I thought of it afterward. When we got up, she was turned the other way, but I couldn't help seeing her cheeks were red. It was terrible. I wondered if Fetterson would notice, though I might have known he wouldn't, not him. He was in too much of a hurry to get at his Jacob's ladder, and then he had to tell me for the tenth time what the inspector said that day about getting him another light. Kingdom come, maybe, he said. I made some excuse or other and got away. Once in the storeroom, I sat down on my cot and stayed there for a long time, feeling queerer than anything. I read a chapter in the Bible. I don't know why. After I'd got my boots off, I sat with them in my hands for as much as an hour, I guess, staring at the oil tank and its lopsided shadow on the wall. I tell you, sir, I was shocked. I was only twenty-two, remember, and I was shocked and horrified. And when I did turn in, finally, I didn't sleep at all well. Two or three times I came to, sitting straight up in bed. Once I got up and opened the outer door to have a look. The water was like glass, dim, without a breath of wind, and the moon just going down. Over on the black shore I made out two lights in a village, like a pair of eyes watching. Lonely? My, yes, lonely and nervous. I had a horror of her, sir. The dinghy boat hung on its davits just there in front of the door, and for a minute I had an awful hankering to climb into it, lower away, and row off, no matter where. <laughs> it sounds foolish. Well, it seemed foolish next morning, with the sun shining and everything as usual, Fetterson sucking his pen and wagging his head over his eternal log, and his wife down in the rocker with her head in the newspaper and her breakfast work still waiting. I guess that jarred it out of me more than anything else. Sight of her slouched down there, with her stringy yellow hair and her dusty apron and the pale back of her neck, reading the society notes. Society notes! Think of it! For the first time since I came to Seven Brothers, I wanted to laugh. I guess I did laugh when I went aloft to clean the lamp and found everything so free and breezy, gulls flying high and little whitecaps making under a westerly. It was like feeling a big load dropped off your shoulders. Fetterson came up with his dust rag and cocked his head at me. "'What's the matter, Ray?' said he. "'Nothing,' said I, and then I couldn't help it. "'Seems kind of out of place for society notes,' said I, out here at Seven Brothers.' He was the other side of the lens, and when he looked at me, he had a thousand eyes, all sober. For a minute I thought he was going on dusting, but then he came out and sat down on a sill. Sometimes, said he, I get to thinking it may be a mite dull for her out here. She's pretty young, Ray. Not much more than a girl, hardly. Not much more than a girl? It gave me a turn, sir, as though I'd seen my aunt in short dresses. It's a good home for her, though, he went on slow. I've seen a lot worse ashore, Ray. Of course, if I could get a shore light. Kingdom comes a shore light. He looked at me out of his deep-set eyes, and then he turned them around the light room where he'd been so long. No, said he, wagging his head. It ain't for such as me. I never saw so humble a man. 
But look here, he went on, more cheerful. As I was telling her just now, a month from yesterday's our fourth anniversary, and I'm going to take her ashore for the day and give her a holiday. New hat and everything. A girl wants a mite of excitement now and then, Ray. There was again that girl. It gave me the fidget, sir. I had to do something about it. It's close quarters for last names in a light, and I'd taken to calling him Uncle Matt soon after I came. Now, when I was at table that noon, I spoke over to where she was standing by the stove, getting him another help of chowder. "'I guess I'll have some, too, Aunt Anna,' said I, matter-of-fact. She never said a word, nor gave a sign, just stood there, kind of round-shouldered, dipping the chowder. And that night at prayers I hitched my chair round the table with its back the other way. You get awful lazy in a lighthouse some ways. No matter how much tinkering you've got, there's still a lot of time, and there's such a thing as too much reading. The changes in weather got monotonous, too, by and by. The light burns the same on a thick night as it does on a fair one. Of course, there's the ships, northbound, southbound, wind jammers, freighters, passenger boats full of people. In the watches at night you can see their lights go by, and wonder what they are, how they're laden, where they'll fetch up, and all. I used to do that almost every evening when it was my first watch, sitting out on the walk around up there with my legs hanging over the edge and my chin propped on the railing. Lazy. The Boston boat was the prettiest to see, with her three tiers of portholes lit, like a string of pearls wrapped round and round a woman's neck. Well away, too, for the ledge must have made a couple of hundred fathoms off the light, like a white dog-tooth of a breaker, even on the darkest night. Well, I was lolling there one night, as I say, watching the Boston boat go by, not thinking of anything special, when I heard the door on the other side of the tower open and footsteps coming around to me. By and by, I nodded toward the boat and passed the remark that she was fetching in uncommon close tonight. No answer. I made nothing of that, for oftentimes Fetterson wouldn't answer, and after I'd watched the lights crawling on through the dark a spell, just to make conversation, I said, I guessed there'd be a bit of weather before long. I've noticed, said I, when there's weather coming on and the wind in the northeast, you can hear the orchestra playing aboard of her just over there. I make it out now. Do you? Yes. Oh, yes. I hear it all right. You can imagine I started. It wasn't him, but her. And there was something in the way she said that speech, sir, something, well, unnatural, like a hungry animal snapping at a person's hand. I turned and looked at her sidewise. She was standing by the railing, leaning a little outward, the top of her from the waist picked out bright by the lens behind her. I didn't know what in the world to say, and yet I had a feeling I ought not to sit there mum. "'I wonder,' said I, "'what the captain's thinking of, fetching in so handy tonight. It's no way. I tell you, if twasn't for this light, she'd go to work and pile up on the ledge some thick night.' She turned at that, and stared straight into the lens. I didn't like the look of her face. Somehow, with his edges cut hard all around, and its two eyes closed down to slits, like a cat's, it made a kind of mask. And then, I went on, uneasy enough, and then where'd all their music be of a sudden, and their goings on, and their singing, and dancing? She clipped me off so quick it took my breath. D dancing said I. That's dance music, said she. She was looking at the boat again. How do you know? I felt I had to keep on talking. Well, sir, <laughs> she laughed. I looked at her. She had on a shawl of some stuff or other that shined in the light. She had it pulled tight around her with her two hands in front at her breast, and I saw her shoulders swaying in tune. How do I know? she cried. Then she laughed again, the same kind of a laugh. It was queer, sir, to see her and to hear her. She turned as quick as that and leaned towards me. Don't you know how to dance, Ray? said she. No, I managed, and I was going to say, Aunt Anna, but the thing choked in my throat. I tell you, she was looking square at me all the time with her two eyes and moving with the music as if she didn't know it. 
by heaven sir it came over me of a sudden that she wasn't so bad looking after all i guess i must have sounded like a fool you you see said i she's cleared the rip there now and the music's gone you you hear yes said she turning back slow that's where it stops every night night after night it stops just there at the rip when she spoke again her voice was different i never heard the like of it thin and taut as a thread it made me shiver sir i hate him that's what she said i hate em all i'd like to see em dead i'd love to see em torn apart on the rocks night after night i could bathe my hands in their blood night after night and do you know sir i saw it with my own eyes her hands moving in each other above the rail but it was her voice though i didn't know what to do or what to say so i poked my head through the railing and looked down at the water i don't think i'm a coward sir but it was like a cold ice-cold hand taking hold of my beating heart when i looked up finally she was gone by and by i went in and had a look at the lamp hardly knowing what i was about then seeing by my watch it was time for the old man to come on duty i started to go below in the seven brothers you understand the stair goes down in a spiral through a well against a south wall and first there's the door to the keeper's room and you come to another and that's the living room and then down to the storeroom and at night if you don't carry a lantern it's as black as the pit well down i went sliding my hand along the rail and as usual i stopped to give a rap on the keeper's door in case he was taking a nap after supper sometimes he did i stood there blind as a bat with my mind still up on the walk around there was no answer to my knock i hadn't expected any just from habit and with my right foot already hanging down for the next step i reached out to give the door one more tap for luck do you know sir my hand didn't fetch up on anything the door had been there a second before and now the door wasn't there my hand just went on going through the dark on and on and i didn't seem to have sense or power enough to stop it there didn't seem any air in the well to breathe and my ears were drumming to the surf that's how scared i was and then my hand touched the flesh of a face and something in the dark said oh no louder than a sigh next thing i knew sir i was down in the living room warm and yellow lit with fetterson cocking his head at me across the table where he was at that eternal jacob's ladder of his what's the matter ray said he lord's sake ray nothing said i then i think i told him i was sick that night i wrote a letter to a l peters the grain dealer in duxbury asking for a job even though it wouldn't go ashore for a couple of weeks just the writing of it made me feel better it's hard to tell you how those two weeks went by i don't know why but i felt like hiding in a corner all the time i had to come to meals but i didn't look at her though not once unless it was by accident fetterson thought i was still ailing and nagged me to death with advice and so on one thing i took care not to do i can tell you and that was to knock on his door till i'd made certain he wasn't below in the living room though i was tempted to yes sir that's a queer thing and i wouldn't tell you if i hadn't set out to give you the truth night after night stopping there on the landing in that black pit the air gone out of my lungs and the surf drumming in my ears and sweat standing cold on my neck and one hand lifting up in the air god forgive me sir maybe i did wrong not to look at her more drooping about her work in her gingham apron with her hair stringing when the inspector came off with the tender that time i told him i was through that's when he took the dislike to me i guess for he looked at me kind of sneering and said soft as i was i'd have to put up with it till next relief and then said he there'd be a whole house cleaning at seven brothers because he'd gotten fetterson the berth at kingdom come and with that he slapped the old man on the back i wish you could have seen fetterson sir he sat down on my cot as if his knees had given way happy you'd think he'd be happy with all his dreams come true yes he was happy beaming all over for a minute then sir he began to shrivel up 
It was like seeing a man cut down in his prime before your eyes. He began to wag his head. No, said he, no, no, it's not for such as me. I'm good enough for seven brothers, and that's all, Mr. Bayliss, that's all. And for all the inspector could say, that's what he stuck to. He'd figure himself a martyr so many years, nursed that injustice like a mother with her firstborn, sir, and now, in his old age, so to speak, they weren't to rob him of it. Fetterson was going to wear out his life in a second-class light, and folks would talk. That was his idea. I heard him hailing down as the tender was casting off. See you tomorrow, Mr. Bayliss. Yep, coming ashore with the wife for a spree. Anniversary. Yep. But he didn't sound much like a spree. They had robbed him, partly, after all. I wonder what she thought about it. I didn't know till night. She didn't show up to supper, which Fetterson and I got ourselves. Had a headache, he said. It was my early watch. I went and lit up and came back to read a spell. He was finishing off the Jacob's ladder, and thoughtful, like a man that's lost a treasure. Once or twice I caught him looking about the room on the sly. It was... it was pathetic, sir. Going up the second time, I stepped out on the walk around to have a look at things. She was there, on the seaward side, wrapped in that silky thing. A fair sea was running across the ledge, and it was coming on a little thick, not too thick. Off to the right, the Boston boat was blowing. Vroom! Vroom! Creeping up on us, quarter speed. There was another fellow behind her, and a fisherman's conch further offshore. I don't know why, but I stopped beside her, and leaned on the rail. She didn't appear to notice me one way or another. We stood, and we stood, listening to the whistles, and the longer we stood, the more it got on my nerves, her not noticing me. I suppose she'd been too much on my mind lately. I began to be put out. I scraped my feet. I coughed. By and by, I said out loud, Look here, I guess I'd better get out the foghorns and give those fellows a toot. Why? said she, without moving her head, calm as that. Why? It gave me a turn, sir. For a minute I stared at her. Why? Because if she don't pick up this light before very many minutes, she'll be too close in to wear. Tide'll have her on the rocks. That's why. I couldn't see her face, but I could see one of her silk shoulders lift a little, like a shrug. And there I kept on staring at her, a dumb one, sure enough. I know what brought me to was hearing the Boston boat's three sharp toots as she picked up the light, mad as anything, and swung her helm a port. I turned away from her, sweat stringing down my face, and walked around to the door. It was just as well, too, for the feed pipe was plugged in the lamp and the wicks were popping. She'd have been out in another five minutes, sir. When I'd finished, I saw that woman standing in the doorway. Her eyes were bright. I had a horror of her, sir, a living horror. If only the light had been out, said she, low and sweet. God forgive you, said I. You don't know what you're saying. She went down the stair into the well, winding out of sight, and as long as I could see her, her eyes were watching mine. When I went myself, after a few minutes, she was waiting for me on that first landing, standing still in the dark. She took hold of my hand, though I tried to get it away. Goodbye, said she in my ear. Goodbye, said I. I didn't understand. You heard what he said today about kingdom come? Be it so, on his own head. I'll never come back here. Once I set foot ashore, I've got friends in Brightonboro, Ray. I got away from her and started on down, but I stopped. Brightonboro? I whispered back. Why do you tell me? My throat was raw to the words, like a sore. So you'd know, said she. Well, sir, I saw them off next morning, down that new Jacob's ladder into the dinghy boat, her in a dress of blue velvet, and him in his best cutaway and derby, rowing away, smaller and smaller, the two of them. And then I went back, and sat on my cot, leaving the door open and the ladder still hanging down the wall, along with the boat falls. I don't know whether it was relief or what. I suppose I must have been worked up even more than I'd thought those past weeks, for now it was all over. I was like a rag. 
I got down on my knees, sir, and prayed to God for the salvation of my soul, and when I got up and climbed to the living room, it was half past twelve by the clock. There was rain on the windows, and the sea was running blue-black under the sun. I'd sat there all that time, not knowing there was a squall. It was funny. The glass stood high, but those black squalls kept coming and going all afternoon while I was at work up in the light room. And I worked hard to keep myself busy. First thing I knew it was five, and no sight of the boat yet. It began to get dim and kind of purplish-gray over the land. The sun was down. I lit up, making everything snug, and got out the night glasses to have another look for that boat. He'd said he intended to get back before five. No sign. And then, standing there, it came over me that, of course he wouldn't be coming off. He'd be hunting her. Poor old fool. It looked like I had to stand two men's watches that night. <laughs> Never mind. I felt like myself again, even if I hadn't had any dinner or supper. Pride came to me that night on the walk around, watching the boats go by. Little boats, big boats, the Boston boat with all her pearls and her dance music. They couldn't see me. They didn't know who I was, but to the last of them, they depended on me. They say a man must be born again. Well, I was born again. I breathed deep in the wind. Dawn broke hard and red as a dying coal. I put out the light and started to go below. Born again. <laughs> yes, sir. I felt so good I whistled in the well, and when I came to the first door on the stair, I reached out in the dark to give it a rap for luck. And then, sir, the hair prickled all over my scalp when I found my hand just going on and on through the air, the same as it had gone once before, and all of a sudden I wanted to yell, because I thought I was going to touch flesh. It's funny what their just forgetting to close their door did to me, isn't it? Well, I reached for the latch and pulled it to with a bang and ran down as if a ghost was after me. I got up some coffee and bread and bacon for breakfast. I drank the coffee, but somehow I couldn't eat, all along of that open door. The light in the room was blood. I got to thinking. I thought how she'd talked about those men, women, and children on the rocks, and how she'd made to bathe her hands over the rail. I almost jumped out of my chair then. It seemed for a wink she was there beside the stove, watching me with that queer half-smile. Really, I seemed to see her for a flash across the red tablecloth in the red light of dawn. A look here, said I to myself, sharp enough, and then I gave myself a good laugh and went below. There I took a look out of the door, which was still open, with the ladder hanging down. I made sure to see the poor old fool come pulling around the point before very long now. My boots were hurting a little, and, taking them off, I lay down on the cot to rest, and somehow I went to sleep. I had horrible dreams. I saw her again, standing in that blood-red kitchen, and she seemed to be washing her hands, and the surf on the ledge was whining up the tower louder and louder all the time, and what it whined was, night after night, night after night. What woke me was cold water in my face. The storeroom was in gloom. That scared me at first. I thought night had come and remembered the light. But then I saw the gloom was of a storm. The floor was shining wet, and the water in my face was spray, flung up through the open door. When I ran to close it, it almost made me dizzy to see the gray and white breakers marching past. The land was gone. The sky shut down heavy overhead. There was a piece of wreckage on the back of a swell and the Jacob's ladder was carried clean away. How the sea had picked up so quick, I can't think. I looked at my watch, and it wasn't four in the afternoon yet. When I closed the door, sir, it was almost dark in the storeroom. I'd never been in the light before in a gale of wind. I wondered why I was shivering so, till I found it was the floor below me shivering, and the walls and stair. Horrible crunchings and grindings ran away up the tower, and now and then there was a great thud somewhere, like a cannon shot in a cave. I tell you, sir, I was alone, and I was in a mortal fright for a minute or so. 
and yet i had to get myself together there was the light up there not tended to and an early dark coming on and a heavy night and all and i had to go and i had to pass that door you'll say it's foolish sir and maybe it was foolish maybe it was because i hadn't eaten but i began thinking of that door up there the minute i set foot on the stair and all the way up through that howling dark well i dreaded to pass it i told myself i wouldn't stop i didn't stop i felt the landing underfoot and i went on four steps five and then i couldn't i turned and went back i put out my hand and it was on into nothing that door sir was open again i left it be i went on up to the light room and set to work it was bedlam there sir screeching bedlam but i took no notice i kept my eyes down i trimmed those seven wicks sir as neat as ever they were trimmed i polished the brass till it shone and i dusted the lens it wasn't till that was done that i let myself look back to see who it was standing there half out of sight in the well it was her sir where do you come from i asked i remember my voice was sharp up jacob's ladder said she and hers was like the syrup of flowers i shook my head i was savage sir the ladder's carried away i cast it off said she with a smile then said i you must have come while i was asleep another thought came on me heavy as a ton of lead and where's he said i where's the boat he's drowned said she as easy as that and i let the boat go adrift you wouldn't hear me when i called but look here said i if you came through the storeroom why didn't you wake me up tell me that it sounds foolish enough me standing like a lawyer in court trying to prove she couldn't be there she didn't answer for a moment i guess she sighed though i couldn't hear for the gale and her eyes grew soft sir so soft i couldn't said she you looked so peaceful dear one my cheeks and neck went hot sir as if a warm iron was laid on them i didn't know what to say i began to stammer what do you mean but she was going back down the stair out of sight my god sir and i used not to think she was good-looking i started to follow her i wanted to know what she meant then i said to myself if i don't go if i wait here she'll come back and i went to the weather side and stood looking out of the window not that there was much to see it was growing dark and the seven brothers looked like the mane of a running horse a great vast white horse running into the wind the air was a welter with it i caught one peep of a fisherman lying down flat trying to weather the ledge and i said god help them all to-night and then i went hot at sound of that god i was right about her though she was back again i wanted her to speak first before i turned but she wouldn't i didn't hear her go out i didn't know what she was up to till i saw her coming outside on the walk around drenched wet already i pounded on the glass for her to come in and not be a fool if she heard she gave no sign of it there she stood and there i stood watching her lord sir was it just that i'd never had eyes to see or are there women who bloom her clothes were shining on her like a carving and her hair was let down like a golden curtain tossing and streaming in the gale and there she stood with her lips half open drinking and her eyes half closed gazing straight away over the seven brothers and her shoulders swaying as if in tune with the wind and water and all the ruin and when i looked at her hands over the rail sir they were moving in each other as if they bathed and then i remembered sir a cold horror took me i knew now why she had come back again she wasn't a woman she was a devil i turned my back on her i said to myself it's time to light up you've got to light up like that over and over out loud 
my hand was shivering so i could hardly find a match and when i scratched it it only flared a second and then went out in the back draft from the open door she was standing in the doorway looking at me it's queer sir but i felt like a child caught in mischief i i was going to light up i managed to say finally why said she no i can't say it as she did why said i my god she came nearer laughing as if with pity lo you know your god and who is your god what is god what is anything on a night like this i drew back from her all i could say anything about was the light why not the dark said she dark is softer than light tenderer dearer than light from the dark up here away up here in the wind and storm we can watch the ships go by you and i and you love me so you've loved me so long ray i never have i struck out at her i don't i don't her voice was lower than ever but there was the same laughing pity in it oh yes you have and she was near me again i have i yelled i'll show you i'll show you if i have i got another match sir and scratched it on the brass i gave it to the first wick the little wick that's inside all the others it bloomed like a yellow flower i have i yelled and gave it to the next then there was a shadow and i saw she was leaning beside me her two elbows on the brass her two arms stretched out above the wicks her bare forearms and wrists and hands i gave a gasp take care you'll burn them for god's sake she didn't move or speak the match burned my fingers and went out and all i could do was stare at those arms of hers helpless i had never noticed her arms before they were rounded and graceful and covered with a soft down like a breath of gold then i heard her speaking close to my ear pretty arms she said pretty arms i turned her eyes were fixed on mine they seemed heavy as if with sleep and yet between their lids they were two wells deep and deep and as if they held all the things i had ever thought or dreamed in them i looked away from them at her lips her lips were red as poppies heavy with redness they moved and i heard them speaking poor boy you love me so and you want to kiss me don't you no said i but i couldn't turn around i looked at her hair i'd always thought it was stringy hair some hair curls naturally with damp they say and perhaps that was it for there were pearls of wet on it and it was thick and shimmering around her face making soft shadows by the temples there was green in it queer strands of green like braids what is it said i nothing but weed said she with that slow sleepy smile somehow or other i felt calmer than i had any time look here said i i'm going to light this lamp i took out a match scratched it and touched the third wick the flame ran around bigger than the other two together but still her arms hung there i bit my lip by god i will said i to myself and i lit the fourth it was fierce sir fierce and yet those arms never trembled i had to look around at her her eyes were still looking into mine so deep and deep and her red lips were still smiling with that queer sleepy droop the only thing was that tears were raining down her cheeks big glowing round jewel tears it wasn't human sir it was like a dream pretty arms she sighed and then as if those words had broken something in her heart there came a great sob bursting from her lips to hear it drove me mad i reached to drag her away but she was too quick sir she cringed from me and slipped out from between my hands 
it was like she faded away sir and went down in a bundle nursing her poor arms and mourning over them with those terrible broken sobs the sound of them took the manhood out of me you'd have been the same sir i knelt down beside her on the floor and covered my face please i moaned please please that's all i could say i wanted her to forgive me i reached out a hand blind for forgiveness and i couldn't find her anywhere i had hurt her so and she was afraid of me of me sir who loved her so deep it drove me crazy i could see her down the stair though it was dim and my eyes were filled with tears i stumbled after her crying please please the little wicks i'd lit were blowing in the wind from the door and smoking the glass beside them black one went out i pleaded with them the same as i would plead with a human being i said i'd be back in a second i promised and i went on down the stair crying like a baby because i'd hurt her and she was afraid of me of me sir she had gone into her room the door was closed against me and i could hear her sobbing beyond it broken-hearted my heart was broken too i beat on the door with my palms i begged her to forgive me i told her i loved her and all the answer was that sobbing in the dark and then i lifted the latch and went in groping pleading dearest please because i love you i heard her speak down near the floor there wasn't any anger in her voice nothing but sadness and despair no said she you don't love me ray you never have i do i have no no said she as if she were tired out where are you i was groping for her i thought and lit a match she had got to the door and was standing there as if ready to fly i went toward her and she made me stop she took my breath away i hurt your arms said i in a dream no said she hardly moving her lips she held them out to the matches light for me to look and there was never a scar on them not even that soft golden down was singed sir you can't hurt my body said she sad as anything only my heart ray my poor heart i tell you again she took my breath away i lit another match how can you be so beautiful i wondered she answered in riddles but oh the sadness of her sir because said she i've always wanted to be how come your eyes so heavy said i because i've seen so many things i never dreamed of said she how come your hair so thick it's the seaweed makes it thick said she smiling queer queer how come seaweed there out of the bottom of the sea she talked in riddles but it was like poetry to hear her or a song how come your lips so red said i because they've wanted so long to be kissed fire was on me sir i reached out to catch her but she was gone out of the door and down the stair i followed stumbling i must have tripped on the turn for i remember going through the air and fetching up with a crash and i didn't know anything for a spell how long i can't say when i came to she was there somewhere bending over me crooning my love my love under her breath like a song but then when i got up she was not where my arms went she was down the stair again just ahead of me i followed her i was tottering and dizzy and full of pain i tried to catch up with her in the dark of the storeroom but she was too quick for me sir always a little too quick for me oh she was cruel to me sir i kept bumping against things hurting myself still worse and it was cold and wet and horrible noise all the while sir and then sir i found the door was open and a sea had parted the hinges i don't know how it all went sir i'd tell you if i could but it's all so blurred sometimes it seems more like a dream i couldn't find her any more i couldn't hear her i went all over everywhere 
Once, I remember, I found myself hanging out of that door between the davits, looking down into those big black seas, and crying like a baby. It's all riddles and blur. I can't seem to tell you much, sir. It was all, all, I don't know. I was talking to somebody else, not her. It was the inspector. I hardly knew it was the inspector. His face was as gray as a blanket, and his eyes were bloodshot, and his lips were twisted. His left wrist hung down, awkward. It was broken, coming aboard the light in that sea. Yes, we were in the living room. Yes, sir, it was daylight, gray daylight. I tell you, sir, the man looked crazy to me. He was waving his good arm toward the weather windows, and what he was saying over and over was this. Look what you've done, damn you, look what you've done. And what I was saying was this. I've lost her. I didn't pay any attention to him, nor him to me. By and by, he did, though. He stopped his talking all of a sudden, and his eyes looked like the devil's eyes. He put them up close to mine. He grabbed my arm with his good hand, and I cried. I was so weak. Johnson, said he, is that it? By the living God, if you got a woman out here, Johnson. No, said I. I've lost her. What do you mean, lost her? It was dark, said I, and it's funny how my head was clearing up. And the door was open, the storeroom door, and I was after her, and I guess she stumbled, maybe, and I lost her. Johnson, said he, what do you mean? You sound crazy, downright crazy. Who? Her, said I. Fetterson's wife. Who? Her, said I. And with that, he gave my arm another jerk. Listen, said he, like a tiger, don't try that on me. It won't do any good, that kind of lies. Not where you're going to. Fetterson and his wife, too. The both of them drowned deader in a doornail. I know, said I, nodding my head. I was so calm it made him wild. You're crazy, crazy as a loon, Johnson. And he was chewing his lip red. I know, because it was me that found the old man laying on backwater flats yesterday morning. Me. And she'd been with him in the boat, too, because he had a piece of her jacket torn off, tangled in his arm. I know, said I, nodding again like that. You know what, you crazy murdering fool? Those were his words to me, sir. I know, said I, what I know. And I know, said he, what I know. And there you are, sir. He's inspector. I'm nobody. End of The Woman at Seven Brothers by Wilbur Daniel Steele From the Straw Hut Among the Seven Peaks by Lu Kuhn, 19th Century This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1. From the high pavilion of the Great Rock, I look down at the Green River. There is the sail of a returning boat. The birds are flying in pairs. The faint snuff color of trees closes the horizon. All about me sharp peaks jag upward, but through my window and beyond is the smooth, broad brightness of the setting sun. 2. Clouds brush the rocky ledge. In the dark green shadow left by the sunken sun a jade fountain flies, and a little stream, thin as the fine thread spun by sad women in prison chambers, slides through the grasses and whirls suddenly upon itself, avoiding the sharp edges of the iris leaves. Few people pass here. Only the hermits of the hills come in companies to gather the imperial fern. End of From the Straw Hut Among the Seven Peaks By Lou Kuhn, 19th Century Read by Sudone Vox
wie sieben Schneider in den Türkenkrieg zogen bei Friedrich Reinhold Kreuzwald. This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Wie sieben Schneider in den Türkenkrieg zogen. Es lebten einmal in alten Zeiten sieben Schneider, denen das Nadeln zuwider geworden war. Sie wollten höher hinaus. Von manchen tapferen Helden hatten sie Erzählen hören und dann vernommen, dass im Türkenlande ein großer Krieg angebrochen sei und dass wackere Männer dahin gesucht würden. Bei dieser Nachricht schwoll unseren Männlein der Kamm. Sie wollten zu Felde ziehen, um sich die Sporen zu verdienen und redeten darum untereinander wie folgt. »Wir stehen wohl auch unseren Mann. Bislang haben wir friedlich Löcher ins Zeug gestochen«, »Gehen wir jetzt mit stärkerem Spieß des Feindes Leiber zu durchbohren!« Sie ließen sich nun einen langen Lanzenschaft aus dem stärksten Eichenholz machen, dann vom Schmiede ihre sieben Scheren zusammenschweißen, zu einer Lanzenspitze zurechthämmern und an das Ende des Schafts festklopfen. Ehe sie sich auf den Weg machten, wurde gelost, wer von ihnen Obermann werden und als Führer vorangehen solle. Als das Los entschieden hatte, stellten sie sich in eine Reihe und nahmen gemeinschaftlich die schwere Lanze auf ihre Schultern, weil eben einem die Last zu schwer geworden wäre. Der erste, der durchs Los gewählte Hauptmann, der die scharfe Spitze der Lanze trug, wurde Nasenmann genannt, weil seine Nase den andern den Weg zeigen sollte. Die fünf folgenden erhielten die Namen Einkraftmann, Zweikraftmann, Dreikraftmann, Vierkraftmann und Fünfkraftmann, was freilich nicht bedeuten sollte, dass einer von ihnen die Kraft von drei oder vier Männern gehabt hätte, sondern nur anzeigen, in welcher Reihenfolge sie marschieren müssten, damit gar keine Irrung entstehen könnte. Der siebente wurde Schwanzmann genannt, weil das hintere Ende des Lanzenschafts auf seiner Schulter lag. Die Kraftmänner aber mussten auch noch abwechselnd den Brotsack tragen, der eine ein Drittel des Tages, der andere das zweite Drittel und so weiter bis zum sechsten. Überdies hatte jeder ein Presseisen in der Tasche, damit nicht auf offenem Felde der starke Wind sie vom Wege fortblasen könnte. Es versteht sich übrigens von selbst, dass die Männer alle ebenso klug wie beherzt waren, da sie wohl sonst nicht gewagt hätten, eine so große Sache zu unternehmen, die ihnen auf jedem Schritte den Tod bringen konnte. So zum Kriege gerüstet zogen alle sieben Männer an einem schönen Sommermorgen aus, nahmen zu rechter Zeit Frühstück und Mittagsmahl, ruhten dazwischen im Schatten der Gebüsche aus, eilten dann wieder weiter und wollten, wenn sie jemandem begegneten, nach dem besten Wege ins Türkenland sich erkundigen. Als sie so über Feld gingen, sah der Nasenmann und sahen auch die andern einen Bauernhof unweit der Straße, und es wurde sofort beschlossen, zwei Männer auf Kundschaft auszuschicken, ob man da nicht noch Mundvorrat für die Reise bekommen könnte. Dreikraftmann und Fünfkraftmann gingen hin, um nachzusehen. Als sie zurückkamen, erzählten sie den anderen, dass sie auf dem Hofe nichts weiter gefunden als drei Weiber und einige Kinder, von Männern nirgends eine Spur. Der Nasenmann sagte, »Kriegsleute müssen Mut haben, also gerade auf den Feind los, und wenn er noch so stark ist.« Die Männer stießen ein Freudengeschrei aus und stürmten auf den Bauernhof los. Als die Weiber die sieben Männer und die lange Lanze sahen, erschraken sie wohl im ersten Augenblick, aber ein Mütterchen, das natürlichen Scharfblick besaß, merkte sogleich, was für Männlein die Andringenden wären und sagte deshalb zu den anderen Weibern, »Diese Feinde jagen wir mit dem Besenstiel zum Hofe hinaus!« nahm einen Besenstiel in die Hand, während ein anderes Weib eine Mistgabel, ein drittes eine Brotschaufel ergriff, und so stellten sie sich vor die Tür, den Feind erwartend. »Halt, Brüderchen!« rief der Nasenmann. »Die Klugheit muß zuweilen den übermäßigen Mut zügeln, sonst könnte es Unglück geben. Wir haben nur eine Waffe, sie aber drei, und viele Hunde sind endlich auch des Bären tot. Kehren wir lieber um.« 
Die anderen fanden des Hauptmanns Rat lobenswert und machten sich deshalb so rasch davon, als ob sie Feuer in den Taschen hätten. Als der Schwanzmann nach einiger Zeit es wagte, über die Schulter zurückzublicken, sah er, dass ihnen kein Feind mehr auf der Ferse sei. Da hemmte man den Lauf und zog langsam weiter. Am Abend gegen Sonnenuntergang flog ein Mistkäfer über die Kriegsmänner hin. Sie hörten das Gesumme seiner Flügel, welches in der Abendstille so fürchterlich klang, dass die Männer schauderten. Der Nasenmann rief, »Brüderchen, der Feind kommt über uns, ich höre schon sein Dröhnen!« Mit diesen Worten ließ er die Lanzenspitze von der Schulter gleiten und lief mit Blitzesschnelle davon. Die anderen dachten, »Unser Leben ist auch nicht zäher als seines.« warfen die Lanze von den Schultern und nahmen, wie ihr Hauptmann, die Flucht, der eine hierhin, der andere dorthin, wie es sich gerade traf. Der Nasenmann hatte eine leere Heuscheune gesehen und lief darauf zu, um eine Zufluchtstätte zu finden. Als er aber hineinsprang, bemerkte er nicht, dass ein Rechen am Boden lag, der, als sein Fuß unversehens die Pflöcke berührte, in die Höhe schnellte und mit dem Stiele gegen sein Gesicht schlug. »Habt Erbarmen oder führt mich ins Gefängnis«, bat Nasenmann, »aber lasst mich leben.« Er hielt nämlich das Anprallen des Stiels für einen Schlag des Feindes. Nach einer Weile, als alles um ihn her still blieb, glaubte er, der Feind habe sich zurückgezogen und wagte nun, die Scheune zu verlassen. Inzwischen hatte nächtliches Dunkel sich über die Gegend gelagert. Wo sollte er jetzt seine Gefährten auffinden?« Sie zu rufen wagte er nicht, denn auch die Feinde hätten seine Stimme hören können. Dieselbe Furcht verschloss den anderen Männern den Mund, so daß keiner ein Zeichen zu geben wagte. Dreikraftmann, der in einen Strauch von wilden Rosen geraten war, konnte jedoch das Stechen der Dornen nicht länger aushalten, sondern fing an bitterlich zu weinen und den Feind, von dessen Lanzenspitzen er sich gequält glaubte, um Gnade zu bitten. »Gnade, Gnade, lieben Leute, es wäre schon an einer Lanze über genug. Warum stecht ihr mich mit so vielen?« Als die Feinde aber nicht darauf hörten, nahm er Reis aus, bis er über den Schwanzmann stolperte und hinfiel. Aber beide wagten sich nicht weiter zu rühren, sondern dachten, wenn wir still bleiben, halten uns die Feinde für tot. So lagen beide bis zum Morgen wo sie erst beim Schein der Morgenröte inne wurden, dass sie Freunde seien. Da nun ringsum nirgends mehr eine Spur vom Feinde zu erblicken war, so riefen sie auch den übrigen zu, die dann auch einer nach dem anderen herankamen. Keiner von allen hatte so viel Schaden genommen wie Dreikraftmann, dessen Körper an vielen Stellen zerkratzt war. Nasenmann sagte, ich weiß zwar nicht, wo ich verwundet bin, aber am Blutfuß merke ich, dass ich Schaden genommen habe, denn meine Hosen sind voll Blut. Als man nachsah, fand sich, dass das Blut eine bräunlich-gelbe Farbe hatte, und Vierkraftmann sagte, der Geruch ist übler als der von Blut. Nasenmann ging, seine Hose zu reinigen, und dankte seinem Glücke, als er sah, dass er nirgends eine Wunde hatte. Darauf beschlossen die Männer einmütig, von ihren ersten Kriegsdrangsalen zu Hause nichts zu sagen. Als die Lanze wieder aufgefunden war, setzten sich alle nieder, um sich durch einen Imbiss zu stärken, ehe sie weiterzögen. Da fiel es dem Nasenmann ein, die Kriegsleute zu überzählen, um zu sehen, ob der zweimalige Zusammenstoß Verluste gebracht habe. Es fand sich, dass ein Mann fehlte. Die anderen zählten ebenfalls, jeder der Reihe nach, und keiner brachte mehr als sechs heraus. Der siebente war verschwunden. Sie zählten so. Ich bin ich, dann eins, zwei, drei, bis zum sechsten. Wer von ihnen nun aber verloren gegangen war, konnte niemand sagen. Endlich kam einem von ihnen ein gescheiter Gedanke, wie angeblasen. Er sah am Boden einen kleinen Misthaufen und sagte zu den Kameraden, wenn jeder seine Nase hineinsteckte, so könnte man sehen, wie viele Löcher dadurch entstanden wären. Sie taten es, und als man darauf die Nasenspuren nachzählte, da fanden sich, o oh Freude, alle sieben. 
Niemand aber konnte begreifen, woher der Irrtum gekommen, dass man beim Zählen nur sechs herausgebracht. Als sie weiterzogen, kamen sie an den Saum eines dichten Waldes, in welchen ein schmaler Pfad hineinführte. Hier wurde wieder Rat gepflogen, was besser wäre, auf diesem Pfade gerade durchzumarschieren oder den Wald in einer weiten Entfernung zu umgehen. Allein, da keiner vorher wissen konnte, ob denn auch ein Weg um den Wald herumführe, so wurde endlich einmütig beschlossen, hindurchzugehen. Der schmale Pfad machte ihnen das Weiterkommen sehr beschwerlich, da sie unaufhörlich rechts und links mit den Händen die Zweige zur Seite biegen mussten. Sie konnten deshalb auch nicht weiter sehen, als die Nase reichte. Ohne aber auf Hindernisse und Dunkelheit zu achten, schritten sie mutig und tapfer vorwärts, so dass sie nicht früher gewahr wurden, dass ein Wolf mitten im Wege schlief, als bis Nasenmann schon den Fuß erhoben hatte, um darauf zu treten. Als er nun so plötzlich die gräuliche Bestie zu seinen Füßen erblickte, rief er voll Schrecken, »Ein Seehund! Ein Seehund!« und sprang jäh zurück, so daß ein Kraft und zwei Kraftmann auf ihre Hintermänner gedrängt wurden und die Männer sämtlich zu Boden fielen, bis auf Schwanzmann, der glücklicherweise aufrecht blieb, wodurch die Lanzenspitze auf den Wolf zu fallen kam. Gern hätten die Männer sämtlich die Flucht ergriffen, wenn die vor Schrecken erstarrten Beine sie hätten tragen wollen, oder wenn der dichte Wald das Durchkommen gestattet hätte. Da also kein Entrinnen möglich war, so mußten sie notgedrungen bleiben und ruhig warten, bis der Seehund einen nach dem andern verschlingen würde. Nasenmann, welcher am nächsten stand, wunderte sich, daß das Raubtier sich nicht vom Flecke rühre, und klug wie er war, schloß er daraus sofort, daß ihre scharfe Lanze dasselbe im Schlafe getötet habe. Als er näher trat und das Tier untersuchte, fand er es entseelt, was freilich nicht von einer durch die Männer ihm beigebrachten Wunde herrührte, sondern schon einige Tage vorher eingetreten war. Nasenmanns Freude über dieses unerwartete Glück war grenzenlos. Als er aber über die Schulter blickte und seine Gefährten alle mit dem Gesicht auf dem Boden liegen fand, erschrak er von Neuem, weil er glaubte, dass sie durch sein Zurückprallen sämtlich vom Lanzenschaft durchbohrt seien, so daß sie daran stäken wie Strömlinge an der Stange. Er hub dann so bitterlich an, sein Herzweh zu klagen, daß der Wald ringsum von seinem Geschrei erscholl. Die anderen glaubten anfangs, daß er unter den Griffen des Tieres schreie und wagten deshalb nicht, sich vom Fleck zu rühren. Als aber das Geschrei andauerte, wurde ihnen so viel klar, daß doch aus dem Bauche des Tieres so lautes Schreien nicht an ihr Ohr dringen konnte. Die Dreisteren hoben die Köpfe etwas in die Höhe und lugten heimlich von unten herauf, um zu entdecken, warum denn ihr Hauptmann so schreie. Sobald sie inne wurden, daß der erschlagene Seehund weder Ohren noch Schwanz rührte und Nasenmann unversehrt neben ihm stand, sprangen sie wie der Wind vom Boden auf und eilten, sich die seltsame Sache anzusehen. Niemand von ihnen war im Geringsten verletzt. Dass sie niedergestürzt, war einzig und allein deshalb geschehen, damit des gräulichen Tieres Auge sie nicht erblicken sollte. Als sie nun zusammen das Untier, wofür sie den Seehund gehalten, zu untersuchen begannen, wo und wie tief ihr Schlachtspeer in dasselbe eingedrungen sei, erstaunten sie wohl sehr darüber, dass an dem Tiere auch nicht die mindeste Spur einer Wunde sichtbar wurde. Dreikraft, man sagte, »Ein Seehund hat doch nicht mehr als zwei natürliche Öffnungen, eine vorn, die andere hinten. Jetzt seht nach, in welche von beiden ist unsere Lanze eingedrungen?« Fünfkraftmann war näher getreten, und als er mit der Nase an den Seehund rührte, rief er, »Oho, Brüderchen, ihr seid auf dem Holzwege. Der Seehund ist schon längst krepiert, denn er stinkt.« »Ja«, sagte Dreikraftmann, »mir ist schon längst ein fauler Geruch wie von einer sauer gewordenen Strömlingstonne in die Nase gestiegen.« Die Männer fassten nun einmütig den klugen Beschluss, dem toten Seehund das Fell abzuziehen und dasselbe an der Lanze zu befestigen, damit alle Welt daraus ersähe, was für tapfere Taten sie verrichtet hätten. Den Leichnam ließen sie im Walde liegen, indem sie sagten, »hat er früher Rinder und Pferde gefressen, so mögen sie jetzt ihn fressen.« 
Da nun aber der Abend hereinbrach und sie noch immer nicht wußten, wie weit der Wald sich noch erstrecken möchte, so mußten sie ihren Marsch beschleunigen, um vorwärts zu kommen. Nach einer Werst hörte der Wald auf, und sie kamen an ein Feld, auf dem nichts weiter wuchs als einiges Wacholdergebüsch. »Hier wollen wir zur Nacht bleiben«, sagte Nasenmann, »denn wir haben heute wie Männer uns gemüht und geplagt.« Während die anderen schliefen, sollte immer einer von ihnen abwechselnd Wache halten, damit ihnen kein Unheil über den Hals käme. Mitten in der Nacht, als gerade Dreikraftmann auf Wache stand, vernahm er ein schauerliches Getöse, weshalb er sogleich seine Gefährten weckte. Die Männer spitzten alle die Ohren, und von Zeit zu Zeit erscholl es Plumps. Plumps als ob jemand einen schweren Stein aus einer Höhe zu Boden würfe. Einige hielten das Geräusch für so schlimm, dass es die Erde unter ihren Füßen erbeben mache. Was konnte das sein? Nasenmann fragte, ob einer sich getraue, dem Geräusche nachzugehen, um zu sehen, was es sei, aber keiner schien Lust zu haben, solch ein Wagnis zu unternehmen. Endlich sagte Dreikraftmann, der manchmal verwickelte Fragen sehr scharfsinnig zu lösen wußte, »Ich glaube zu wissen, was das Geräusch zu bedeuten hat. Des erschlagenen Seehundes Geist geht sicherlich als Gespenst um.« Als aber das Geräusch immer näher kam, sagte Schwanzmann, »mir fällt etwas ein, wie wir unseres Gespenstes am besten Herr werden können.« »Die Gespenster müssen sich vor wilden Tieren fürchten. Ich wickele das Fell des erschlagenen Seehundes wie einen Pelz um mich und gehe auf allen Vieren dem Geräusch entgegen. Dann jage ich das Ding gewiss in die Flucht.« Der Anschlag gefiel den Männern, und so wurde Schwanzmann in das Seehundfell gewickelt. Und damit er auch sonst nicht ohne Schutz gegen Gefahren bleibe, nahmen die andern die Lanze auf die Schultern und gingen in einem Abstand von hundert Schritten hinter ihm her. Schwanzmann war noch nicht weit gekommen, da sah er auf dem Felde ein gräuliches, fünffüßiges Tier, das hatte zwei lange Hörner und feurige Augen im Kopfe, die wie Kerzen weithin leuchteten. Wunderlich war sein Gang, die beiden Vorderfüße hob es zugleich auf, als wären die Beine zusammengewachsen, die Mittelfüße traten einer nach dem anderen einher, der fünfte Fuß aber schien dazu vorhanden zu sein, dass ihn das Tier wie einen Flügel bald links, bald rechts schwinge, wahrscheinlich um die Bewegung des schweren Körpers zu erleichtern. Den Kopf hielt das Tier am Boden und brauchte ihn wohl dazu, den Körper vorn zu stützen. Als unser Freund das alles gesehen hatte, hielt er es für das Gescheiteste, so sacht als möglich zurückzugehen, ehe das grässliche Tier ihn erblicke. Als die andern seinen Bericht gehört hatten, wurde sogleich beschlossen, das Weite zu suchen, damit das gräuliche Tier sie nicht fände. Hätte nicht die Furcht den Augenschwanzmanns ein Blendwerk vorgemacht, so würde er ein Wesen gesehen haben, das weder ihm noch den andern Angst erregt hätte, nämlich ein gekoppeltes Pferd, welches diese Nacht auf der Weide graste. Die vermeintlichen Hörner waren des Tieres Ohren, der Schwanz, sein fünfter Fuß, und die feurigen Augen hatte ihn die Furcht des Beschauers geschaffen. Am folgenden Tage ging ihre Reise glücklich vonstatten, und es stieß ihnen weiter kein Hindernis auf als ein kleiner See, an dessen Ufer sie gegen Abend gelangten. Vom hohen Ufer aus gesehen wogte der blaue See vor ihren Augen, als ob ein Windstoß über die Wasserfläche hinfahre. Die in den Türkenkrieg ziehenden Männer ließen sich am Ufer auf den Rasen nieder und hielten Rat, wie sie hinüberkommen sollten, da nirgends in der Nähe weder Boot noch Kahn zu sehen war. Hätten sie gewußt, dass ihr Sitz nichts weiter als ein Erdhaufen war und der vermeintliche See ein Flachsfeld, das gerade mit blauen Blüten bedeckt war, so hätte ihnen das Ratschlagen weniger Kopfbrechen gekostet. Nasenmann sagte, »Hier hilft alles nichts.« »Über den See müssen wir. Wie sollten wir sonst nach Türkenland kommen? Hätte einer von uns die Stärke des Kalefsohnes, so könnte er uns mit Leichtigkeit über den See ans andere Ufer tragen. Oder ist jemand tüchtiger Schwimmer, der bringe die anderen der Reihe nach über den See aufs Trockene?« Dreikraftmann sagte, »Hast du die Stärke, so sei der Kalefsohn und trage uns durch den See. Oder bist du ein geschickter Schwimmer, so schwimm und nimm uns mit.« 
Fünfkraftmann aber, der gerade hinter seinem Rücken stand, stieß ihn vom Ufer. Oder richtiger gesprochen, vom Erdhaufen hinunter. Dreikraftmann erschrak anfangs nicht wenig. Als er aber merkte, dass er mit der Nase auf trockenem Rasen lag, fühlte er alsbald wieder Mut in sich und rief aus, »Wer ein wackrer Mann sein will, der komme mir nach!« Da stieß Nasenmann noch zwei Männer vom Ufer und die übrigen sprangen von freien Stücken hinunter. Außer einer kleinen Erschütterung verspürte keiner weiteren Schaden und alle waren froh, dass das Waagestück gelungen war und das gefürchtete Wasser sie nicht nass gemacht hatte. Die Lanze aber hatten die Männer am Ufer vergessen und mussten nun zurückgehen, um ihre Waffe zu holen, weil ein Krieger ohne Lanze ebenso wenig weiterkommt als ein Ackersmann ohne Pflug. Da der Abend angebrochen und eine geschützte Stelle zur Hand war, so wollten die Männer hier übernachten und nach gepflogener Beratung wurde ein Lager hergerichtet. Als die Kriegsmänner sich eben schlafen legen wollten, drang der Feind auf sie ein. Es war ein Bauer mit einem derben Knüttel auf der Schulter, der scheltend herankam. »Ihr Lumpengesindel«, rief er, »habt ihr nicht anderswo Raum, euch niederzulassen, als auf meinem Flachsfelde? Wartet, ihr Galgenschwengel, ich will euch den Rücken so blau schlagen wie die Flachsblüten.« Die Türkenbekämpfer aber dachten, »besser Furcht als Reue«, und ergriffen die Flucht, kaum dass sie noch zu viel Zeit hatten, die Lanze mitzunehmen. Sie hätten sich wohl auch zur Wehr setzen können, aber der Feind war so plötzlich und mit so wildem Grimm auf sie eingestürmt, dass es ihnen nicht beikam, den Kampf aufzunehmen. Erst nachdem sie einige Werst weit geflohen waren, fiel es ihnen ein, sich zur Wehr zu setzen, aber wo sollten sie jetzt den Feind hernehmen? Ebenso gut hätten sie die Luft greifen können. »Wir hätten ihn ja kurz und klein schlagen können,« sagte Nasenmann, »wenn er uns nicht so unvermutet über den Hals gekommen wäre.« Dreikraftmann sagte, »und was für einen Knüttel führte er. Ich danke meinem Glücke, dass er nicht dazu kam, meinen Rücken zu messen. Er hätte mir alle Knochen zu Brei geschlagen. Aber was meint ihr dazu, Kameraden, wenn wir morgen früh unsere Schritte wieder heimwärts lenkten?« der Teufel weiß, wie weit das Türkenland noch sein mag und was für Unglück uns noch zustoßen kann, ehe wir hinkommen. Die anderen fanden sogleich, dass Dreikraftmanns Rat gut war. Aber, sagte Nasenmann, den Weg, den wir gekommen sind, gehe ich nicht zurück. Da würden wir wie die Mäuse der Katze in den Rachen laufen und unsere Haut zu Markte tragen, weil der Mann mit dem Knüttel nicht verfehlen würde, uns durchzubläuen. Alle mußten zugeben, dass Nasenmann recht hatte, und nachdem sie über die halbe Nacht damit zugebracht hatten, die Sache nach allen Seiten hin zu erörtern, wurde einmütig beschlossen, auf einem anderen Wege zurückzukehren. Da kamen sie denn nach einigen Tagen an das Ufer eines Sees, in welchem wirklich Wasser floss und also nicht bloß ein blauer Schimmer der Oberfläche sie täuschte. »Das ist also der Peipussee«, rief Vierkraftmann, der den Ort sogleich erkannte, aber hier müssen wir sehr vorsichtig sein, weil hier ein gar gräuliches Untier wohnen soll. Ob Vierfüßler, Vogel oder Fisch kann ich nicht mit Sicherheit angeben, aber das habe ich aus alter Leute Mund vernommen, dass der Kalef Sohn selber es nicht bezwungen hat. Nasenmann stand eine Weile nachdenklich und sagte dann, wenn sich die Sache wirklich so verhält, wie du sagst, so müssen wir ihm entgegenziehen und ihm das gar ausmachen. Diese Tat wird uns mehr Ehre und Ruhm bringen als einen Kampf gegen die Türken. Als sie nun des Waldes ansichtig wurden, in welchem das Untier seinen Aufenthalt haben sollte, da sank ihnen freilich wieder das Herz in die Hosen, was übrigens auch anderen Wackeren begegnen kann. Dennoch wollten sie die Heldentat nicht aufgeben. »Wer kann wissen, ob wir mit dem Leben davonkommen?« sagte Nasenmann. »Der Tod kümmert sich nicht um des Menschen Alter, sondern rafft dahin, wen er eben packt.« nun wollen wir aber nicht mit leerem Magen aus dieser Welt scheiden. Darum, ihr Brüderchen, setzen wir uns nieder und verzehren wir vor unserem Ende noch einmal unser Brot. Vielleicht, hier stürzten ihm Tränen aus den Augen, ist es unsere letzte Mahlzeit. Da wurde den Männern gar wehmütig ums Herz, als sie ihres Anführers Betrübnis sahen und als sie daran dachten, dass, wenn das heutige Brot gegessen sei, sie wohl kein neues mehr backen würden. Während sie sich so über den Tod unterhielten, versäumte doch keiner darüber, sich satt zu essen, denn sie meinten, mit vollem Mage lasse es sich leichter sterben als mit leerem. 
Nach dem Essen begannen die Männer sich gegen den Feind zu rüsten, wobei es viel Hin- und Herreden gab. Nasenmann, der bis jetzt immer der Erste gewesen war, meinte jetzt, er habe dieses Ehrenamt lange genug bekleidet und wünschte, dass ein anderer an seine Stelle träte. Aber die anderen sträubten sich dagegen und sagten, es wäre nicht in Ordnung, wenn sie sich vor ihren Vorgesetzten drängen wollten. Mut hätten sie genug, nur keinen Körper, der mit ihrem Mute gleichen Schritt hielte. Dreikraftmann meinte, ob es denn nicht das Beste wäre, wenn einer für alle anderen stürbe und der Hauptmann dies auf sich nehme, aber Nasenmann schrie, dass der Wald widerhalte. »So haben wir nicht gewettet. Wer einen guten Rat zu geben weiß, der hat auch die Pflicht, meine ich, selber diesem Rate gemäß zu handeln.« Nachdem sie noch eine Zeit lang gezankt und hin und her gestritten hatten, so einigten sie sich endlich dahin, dass alle gleichzeitig mit der Lanze auf den Feind eindringen sollten, nahmen die Lanze auf die Achseln und zogen in alter Weise dem Walde zu, wo das böse Untier hauste. Bevor sie den Wald erreichten, mussten sie über ein Blachfeld. Da war eine Dame vom Espenhain oder gerade herausgesagt ein Hase, der sich eben gesetzt hatte und seine langen Ohren emporstreckte. Dieser grässliche Anblick erschreckte die Schneider der Gestalt, dass sie sogleich stillstanden und sich berieten, ob sie vorwärts gehen, gerade auf das grässliche Untier losstürmen und es mit ihrer langen, scharfen Lanze durchbohren sollten, oder ob es nicht besser sei, die Flucht zu ergreifen, ehe das Tier über sie herfalle und einen nach dem anderen hinunterschlucke. Da nun Schwanzmann der Hinterste und durch sechs Mann vor sich geschützt war, so schwoll seine Verwegenheit so sehr an, dass er dem Nasenmann zurief, »Stoß den Feind nieder! Wir helfen ja von hinten nach!« Aber Nasenmann erwiderte, »Du hast gut schwatzen, du bist durch andere gedeckt. Wärest du an meiner Stelle, so viele das Herz dir wohl zwanzigmal in die Hosen.« So haderten die Männer eine Weile. Einer gab immer dem anderen Schuld, dass man nicht gerade auf den Feind losgehe. Allen aber standen vor Furcht die Haare zu Berge wie die Schweinsborsten. Endlich aber rief Nasenmann, »Gehen wir denn, ihr Männer, gerade drauf los!« kniff die Augen zu und stürmte vorwärts. Dabei schrie er aus Leibeskräften »Hojo! Hojo!« worauf der Hase nach dem Walde davonlief. Als Nasenmann nach dem Feinde blinzelte und seine Flucht sah, rief er vor Freude »Er weicht schon! Er weicht schon! Er weicht schon! Ebenso gut könnte man die Luft greifen! Seht, Männer, seht, er läuft wie ein Hase! Sollte es nicht gar ein Hase sein?« Dreikraftmann sagte »Ich weiß nicht, Brüderchen, wo du deine Augen gelassen hast. Das Tier hat die Größe eines Füllens.« Vierkraftmann wollte dies berichtigen und meinte, »Das Tier sei doch wohl so hoch wie ein Pferd.« Fünfkraftmann sagte, »Meinem Auge erscheint ein Ochs mit diesem Tiere verglichen kleiner als ein junger Hund.« Schwanzmann aber meinte, das Tier habe die Höhe eines Heuschobers. So konnten die Männer sich lange nicht einigen über die Größe des Tieres, das aber mussten sie zuletzt alle einräumen, dass der Unhold auf den ersten Anblick allerdings einen Körper habe wie ein Hase, jedoch um vieles größer sei als ein Hirsch. Als nun die Türkenlandskämpfer aus der eben beschriebenen Fährlichkeit alle glücklich mit dem Leben und mit gesunden Gliedmaßen davongekommen waren, wurde zur Stärkung ein Imbiss genommen. Dann überlegten sie, was nun zunächst zu tun sei. Dass sie bislang auf ihrem Zuge mehr als genug wackere Taten vollbracht, welche im Gedächtnis der Nachkommen fortleben würden, das fühlte jeder von ihnen. Und ein jeglicher war dessen froh, dass er an seinem Teile ein Mann gewesen sei, den keine Drangsal vom rechten Pfade hatte ablenken können. Nach langem Ratschlagen wurde beschlossen wie folgt. »Wer so viele Tage lang Hitze und Beschwerden ertragen wie wir sieben«, der hat ein volles Recht, heimzukehren und fortan unter dem Schatten des Ehren- und Ruhmesbaums, welchen vereinte Tapferkeit gepflanzt, die Tage seines Alters zu verleben. Lanze und Seehundshaut aber sollen zu ewigem Gedächtnis an einem passenden Orte aufgehängt werden, den Nachkommen zur Schau, damit alle Schneider Kunde erhalten von den Taten, welche ihre Vorväter auf der Welt verrichteten. Ob gegenwärtig noch Überbleibsel von dem berühmten Schlachtspeer und von der Seehundhaut vorhanden sind, weiß ich nicht mit Sicherheit anzugeben. Was aber männiglich bekannt ist, das ist der Schneider Mut und Tapferkeit. 
Diese von ihren Vorfahren überkommenen Eigenschaften sind das Erbteil aller Schneider und werden ihnen verbleiben bis an der Weltende. End of Wie sieben Schneider in den Türkenkrieg zogen Bei Friedrich Reinhold Kreuzwald Read by Martin Harbecke Sonnet 75 from Amoretti by Edmund Spencer this is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. one day i wrote her name upon the strand but came the waves and washed it away again i wrote it with a second hand but came the tide and made my pains his prey vain man said she that dost in vain assay a mortal thing so to immortalize for i myself shall like to this decay and eke my name be wiped out likewise not so quoth i let baser things devise to die in dust but you shall live by fame my verse your virtues rare shall eternize and in the heavens write your glorious name where when as death shall all the world subdue our love shall live and later life renew end of sonnet seventy five from amoretti by edmund spencer sonnet seventy seven from amoretti by edmund spencer was it a dream or did i see it plain a goodly table of pure ivory all spread with junkets fit to entertain the greatest prince with pompous royalty mongst which there in a silver dish did lie two golden apples of unvalued price far passing those which hercules came by or those which atalanta did entice exceeding sweet yet void of sinful vice that many sought yet none could ever taste sweet fruit of pleasure brought from paradise by love himself and in his garden placed her breast that table was so richly spread my thoughts the guests which would thereon have fed end of sonnet seventy seven by edmund spencer Recording by Bob Gonzalez Sonnet 7 by William Shakespeare This is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Lo, in the Orient, when the gracious light lifts up his burning head, each under eye doth homage to his new appearing sight serving with looks his sacred majesty and having climbed the steep up heavenly hill resembling strong youth in his middle age yet mortal looks adore his beauty still attending on his golden pilgrimage but when from that highmost pitch with weary car like feeble age he reeleth from the day the eyes for duteous now converted are from his low tract and look another way so thou thyself outgoing in thy noon unlooked on diest unless thou get a son end of sonnet seven by william shakespeare sonnet seventeen by william shakespeare who will believe my verse in time to come if it were filled with your most high deserts though yet heaven knows it is but as a tomb which hides your life and shows not half your parts if i could write the beauty of your eyes and in fresh numbers number all your graces the age to come would say this poet lies such heavenly touches ne'er touched earthly faces so should my papers yellowed with their age be scorned 
like old men of less truth than tongue and your true rights be termed a poet's rage and stretched metre of an antique song but were some child of yours alive that time you should live twice in it and in my rhyme end of sonnet 17 by william shakespeare recording by bob gonzales sonnet 71 by william shakespeare this is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org no longer mourn for me when i am dead than you shall hear the surly sullen bell give warning to the world that i am fled from this vile world with vilest worms to dwell nay if you read this line remember not the hand that writ it for i love you so that i in your sweet thoughts would be forgot if thinking on me then should make you woe oh if i say you look upon this verse when i perhaps compounded am with clay do not so much as my poor name rehearse but let your love even with my life decay lest the wise world should look into your moan and mock you with me after i am gone end of sonnet seventy one by william shakespeare sonnet seventy three by william shakespeare that time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang in me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west which by and by black night doth take away death's second self that seals up all in rest in me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as the death-bed whereon it must expire consumed with that which it was nourished by this thou perceiv'st which makes thy love more strong to love that well which thou must leave ere long end of sonnet seventy three by william shakespeare recording by bob gonzales sonnet number seven from amoretti by edmund spencer this is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org fair eyes the mirror of my mazed heart what wondrous virtue is contained in you the which both life and death forth from you dart into the object of your mighty view for when ye mildly look with lovely hue then is my soul with life and love inspired but when you lower or look on me askew then do i die as one with lightning fired but since that life is more than death desired look ever lovely as becomes you best that your bright beams of my weak eyes admired may kindle living fire within my breast such life should be the honour of your light such death the sad example of your might end of sonnet number seven from amoretti by edmund spencer recording by bob gonzales sonnet seventeen from amoretti by edmund spencer this is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the glorious portrait of that angel's face made to amaze weak men's confused skill 
and this world's worthless glory to embase what pen what pencil can express her fill for though he colours could devise at will and eke his learned hand at pleasure guide least trembling it his workmanship should spill yet many wondrous things there are beside the sweet eye-glances that like arrows glide the charming smiles that rob sense from the heart the lovely pleasance and the lofty pride cannot expressed be by any art a greater craftsman's hand thereto doth need that can express the life of things indeed end of sonnet seventeen from amoretti by edmund spencer recording by bob gonzales sonnet seventy seven by william shakespeare this is recorded to celebrate the seventh anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org thy glass will show thee how thy beauties wear thy dial how thy precious minutes waste these vacant leaves thy mind's imprint will bear and of this book this learning mayst thou taste the wrinkles which thy glass will truly show of mouthed graves will give thee memory thou by thy dial's shady stealth mayst know time's thievish progress to eternity look what thy memory cannot contain commit to these waste blanks and thou shalt find those children nursed delivered from thy brain to take a new acquaintance of thy mind these offices so oft as thou wilt look shall profit thee and much enrich thy book end of sonnet seventy seven by william shakespeare recording by bob gonzales